Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to the pre-show here coming up before the Mummy Rewatch, which starts at 10. <clears throat> Let me check in with the chat and welcome everybody. I did set this up, but I didn't see, um, I, I must have missed some of the comments because I did see Nanette, Netter's Network, was first. And I think this is your first time ever being first, isn't it, Netter? At least on my channel. So uh, congrats if that is the case. Wanted to uh, to celebrate that, and to celebrate that, I'll go through the chat here in a second and finish saying hi to other people. But I did want to put in the chat, Netter's Network has her first video up, so I just uh, put that in the chat there. The link uh, she just posted that in Professor Geek Facebook group, so she has content on her channel now. Really cool, uh, little quick tip on how to save space when you're trying to save those boxes. So, and she's so natural in front of the camera too. She's just like a like a little Vanna White or something like that, just her movements and everything like that. It was quite impressive, quite impressive. Look look forward to more Netters Network. So uh, yeah, make sure you go watch that video, give it, a, you know, give it a view. It's like a minute and 41 seconds. It's no big deal. You can even watch it while you've got me playing here. But uh, that'll give her views and uh, make sure you thumbs up. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do that, of course, because all of these new channels popping up, we need to uh, to give those give those that head start they need. So congrats on that. Next person I saw, I don't know if there's anybody in between because when I refreshed or when I brought up the YouTube again, the only thing the only thing I saw at all was Melissa Harris. So welcome, Melissa Harris. Great to have you here. I saw you uh, say see you at nine and then that comment disappeared, but I saw you say hello again as well. And as Netters Network says, yes, <laughs> Troy can attest to it. He did. He, he sent a screenshot and posted it uh, on Facebook. So yes, documented proof. Netters Network is here first. Welcome, Sertorin Clegane, Matanui, Meep, good, good. Uh, Daniel Heron, welcome. It says, debate of the century or Professor Geek, easiest decision all day. Uh, are you talking about the, the political debate? I never watch those. Never watch those. No, I never, I never care. I, I'm going to vote for the pro-life candidate. I don't care. I don't, I don't, the whole political season can just be whatever. I'm going to vote for the pro-life candidate. And all the liberal Democrats lose their mind. Ah, you just a single issue bubble. I'm the most fundamental right issue voter there is. If you can't get on board with the fundamental right to life, don't talk to me about how you got to treat people every other way. So that's uh, that's me getting political on my channel, right? Right at the gate, <laughs> opening of the pre-show. Uh, Owen Lister, welcome, sir. Welcome. Casey Scott, hey. Classic Casey Scott opening. <clears throat> Sound engraver might have her oh hey there from Casey from uh, Wolf Ten Media, but I've got Casey Scott's hey. I'll just pretend he doesn't do that to everybody else. That's just my that's just your yours and my thing, right, Casey Scott? Uh, let's see, talking to each other. Welcome, Crispy. Welcome, sir. Great to see you. And who else do we have in here? A lot of chats going back and forth. Melissa Harris says is the mummy and Frankenstein technically zombies and undead. Yeah, they are. Different types, of course, because that's actually a good distinction, Melissa. I'm glad you brought that up. That's something that I'll bring up again when we start doing the rewatch. So, Nanette, Troy, uh, if Al's here too, um, RG Boomer, I I'd like to talk about that too. That is a difference. You know, Karloff plays them both in the classic Universal Monsters. They are both technically zombies in the sense, as you said, returning from the dead, but in very different ways. Whereas the mummy are Frankenstein is. is science, you know, uh, brought back to life, uh, stitched together, not even one dead person brought back to life, but, a, you know, amalg uh, amalgamation of uh, corpses given life and, and reanimated. But the mummy is a mystical return from death of a single person. So that's, uh, yeah, it's interesting to maybe draw some comparisons on that as we go through the rewatch. I'm glad you brought that up. <clears throat> so Troy Pacelli is with us, of course. Says the Stephen Cruz at Professor Geek th theme sounds really cool, mixed with the Universal theme. I discovered getting the film ready. Oh, cool! Yeah, and, uh, and th thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, Stephen Cruz, that theme that I play, tried to play it last time, but Google Docs wasn't wasn't uh, co cooperating. But yeah, Stephen Cruz, Stephen Cruz himself on Facebook and uh, Twitter. I think it's Stephen Ant Cruz on uh, on Twitter. But uh, yeah, great great musician. He pr provides a lot of the music on the Professor Geek channel throughout the years much appreciated to him very much so and hopefully he can join us tonight or get back to joining us soon i know his work schedule i think was going a little weird but uh he did join us you know a little bit one time a couple weeks ago so hopefully he can get back in here and hang out with us again because we miss our stephen cruz definitely 
Let's see what else going on. Troy Pacelli also says, actually, Casey Scott was second. Okay, Casey Scott was second, but Melissa Harris was right in there. Great, great, cool. I'll give you your uh, your, your uh, place there, Casey Scott. Got Nanette giving everybody their coveted Netters Network hellos. <clears throat> Owen Lister says, ever consider watching the 80s action masterpiece that is Commando? It's an Arnie classic. Uh, I, You know, I've seen Commando probably like when I was in middle school. And the cool thing to do was to watch all of the, the action movies and stuff like that, which was a little bit after their time anyway, because middle school for me would have been early 90s, but uh, our, our late elementary school, I don't know. But yeah, I, I've watched it at some point, never watched it again. Those movies really aren't my forte. I bet you they'd be perfect fodder for Al's channel. And I bet you they will show up there at some, at some point because he loves those kinds of things. Definitely. Yeah. Um. Casey Scott, breaking my heart. Sorry, Prof, but it's my entrance to every stream. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think I've welcomed everybody new to the chat anyway, but we've got more than that watching. So do click that thumbs up if you haven't. I think if my YouTube window's caught up, we do have as many thumbs up as we have watching now. So uh, yeah, please do that. That would be great. Owen Lister says, even if I get the chance to watch the original Mummy movie, the Brandon Fraser version is still my preferred version. You will not hear me say anything bad about the Brandon Fraser version. I love that movie. I really do. I think Al already did a rewatch re of it. I'll probably do a rewatch of it on my channel too at some point because uh, it's it's that's that's how you do a remake. That is how you do a remake. The Stephen Summers, I think, was the the, the creative mind behind that, um, and that is how you do it. You don't try to redo the original film point by point. You don't even try to redo everything about the original film. If you want to do a remake, re-envision it. That's the only justification in my mind for remaking a film that was already perfectly done in its day or in its time. And the, and the Brandon Fraser Mummy movie is a perfect example of that. They took the Mummy story, but they folded in that Indiana Jones-like adventure. So you've got this swashbuckling hero in Brendan Fraser's character, and you've got all the mysticism, of course, and, and they and they did it on a grander scale, of course. Things they could do, you know, special effects wise, they couldn't have done certainly in 1932 when the original mummy was created. And and I love that. I think that's great. You know, now you've got the mummy in the classic Universal monster sense that we're going to watch and celebrate tonight. But then you've got it done in the 90s. They're completely different. Um, what year? What 90s was it? Was it 92 that it came out? That would have been perfect. That would have been, you know. Uh, you know, divisible by 10 in the years that uh, uh, followed the mummy. But, you know, me and numbers, I don't remember that kind of stuff very well. So, uh, but yeah, no, that was great. Now the Tom Cruise, that's a perfect example. Okay. So the mummy, uh, the Brendan Fraser mummy, the Stephen Summers mummy re-envisioned that first movie, did something completely unique and original with it and really cool. Something that you can add to the mummy, not canon because it's not continuity, but you know, you can add to the mummy classics there. And then what that nut job, uh, I don't know, who's the guy, who's the Q-tip? I'm getting his name, Kurtzman, Kurtzman, <laughs> the guy who for some reason still gets work in Hollywood. I have no reason why, no idea why, because he's just, he fails and bombs at everything he's done. And he does it so horribly. I don't know why he's still getting Star Trek credits and whatnot. But, uh, you know, he was behind The Mummy with Tom Cruise. And of course, Tom Cruise had to have his fingers in, you know, the control of it and everything. But look what that movie did. It did no even remotely kind of original take. It tried to redo the version. It tried to recapture all of that spirit, the adventure spirit, you know, this and that. And you've got the antiquity, the museums and all of that. I mean, you're going to have some element of that with any kind of mummy story. And, and, the, and the, the folding in of the, of the Indiana Jones type style was kind of natural, you know, even though it was new. So granted, it would take a little bit of, uh, it would take a little bit of, creativity and original thinking to go somewhere new with it, but you could do it. You could very easily do it. And they decided not to. They decided just to, you know, keep on rolling with uh, with the nonsense because they can't fail. They're Hollywood. You know, <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. So, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, I do. I didn't catch, I didn't check uh, to see maybe Troy or if you know, or if Al's around, if he knows too, Al's too cool to watch my life, my pre-shows. He's Maybe, maybe if I'm lucky, Al will click it on in the background, but he's got Al, Al stuff to do. He's got pigs to kill and angry birds and, you know, big Al stuff to do. He's too too cool to participate in my pre-shows. But, but if he's there lurking in the background, 
maybe one of you know is uh is the mummy streaming somewhere or is it available i mean i'm sure you know on the high seas you guys got it of course but uh is it is it streaming somewhere or available to rent somewhere for cheap you know it usually is 2.99 somewhere most films are but Owen Lester's asking if he was able to watch it. So, yeah, that would be a, a way to do it. Daniel Heron says, I could do The Mummy for Halloween as a wonderful Goldsmith score. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be cool. Definitely. And uh, I do like that. I love that the community is so, so built up now. All of our little family here, the Professor Geek family, the Professor Geek friends and family. <laughs> uh, the, the, I call it the PGU, the Professor Geek universe. <laughs> But uh, we've got every night covered now, and some nights are already doubled up. So, so it's 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 uh, it's inevitable that we are going to to have streams that start to compete with each other a little bit. I need to to find a night to do my gaming stream this week because I am going to do a gaming stream of the Knights of the Old Republic, and uh, try to do that. It's, it might be rough. It might be hard because it's a long game. But I am going to try to finish the whole game and try to do it in like two weeks three weeks maybe or whatever, if I can get some long, good long gaming streams in. And those gaming streams are going to be specifically uh, focused on trying to get the story out there. So I am going to shut up during the cutscenes. I'm going to let them play, you know, and and uh, we'll, we'll do the little choices as we go along and show you the gameplay. And I'll have the camera. I'll be interacting with the chat too, you know. But the idea will be for those who don't, who aren't gamers to be able to experience that amazing, wonderful story. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, Owen Lister says 1999. So when the mummy, okay, when that mummy movie came out. <clears throat> uh, Troy says the mummy 1932 is available to rent on YouTube. Good. All right. And probably other places as well. So, so good. Um, I, I do, sorry, got an itchy ear. Speaking of Knights of the Old Republic, I, I get those Google, you know, where it like tracks you and, and knows your uh, blood type and everything like that. So it tries this to, pitch you news stories that may be of interest to you or whatever on my phone. And it does give me you know, alerts occasionally. And one of them came up, which came up, you know, somewhat regularly, regularly over the past few weeks is uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Are they going to be doing a, uh, or there's a call for it. Apparently there's even a petition now, a fan petition for them to re-release a anniversary edition of the video game on modern platforms and stuff like that. Now that would be cool. I would like that. I uh -huh, that. Even though with that, I would still be nervous that they would try to cut certain scenes that didn't fit their new BS Disney narrative or um, try to add certain things or whatever. But, you know, if they just did it as video games sometimes are done, if they, they re-release classic games and kind of maybe update the graphics a little bit or something. I mean, it'll never replace that classic, even with the clunky, you know, 1990s xbox one platform graphics and everything it's still it's still magical it's still a wonderful play and i recommend people do that because you can buy the classic game if you have an xbox you can buy the classic game on the xbox store and play it on xbox 360 or xbox one or whatever the new console's named is i, I forget the name of it so that would be uh yeah that would be done and uh but there but there's you know petition to get that get that um original game the story, though, insinuated that Disney isn't biting or there's anything about it or they're not responding because, and this would make perfect sense because this is what Disney does, and even right now in their, in their situation, they're desperate. They're desperate to draw people back to their Star Wars movies and Star Wars content because they know they've driven them all the way, but they don't want to clean up their act. They certainly don't want to do that, you know, but they're desperate, and if it would be 100% in character for them to go ahead and green light either a single film or even a whole trilogy about the Knights of the Old Republic springing off of that game. In their minds, that guarantees all the classic Star Wars fans to show up. You're, of course you're going to come see that because it, I, I, you know, and, and the fan addicts, you know, out there are, are just dumb enough to go give their money to that automatically. But I, I, I don't think as many people are going to automatically be on board with that as, as they think. They'll find some way to weave some stupid prophecy of Ahsoka into the game, I'm sure. They'll 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 cast some horrible people. They'll get a, a ridiculous ideologue to direct it. Uh, it's just um, no, no. I, I I hope and pray that Disney ha that never touches this story arc. Disney's unworthy of it. If Disney proved a, a wonderful, respectful track record for about thirty years, maybe I would acquiesce to them doing something with Knights of the Old Republic. But they are so far gone. They don't get that. They they have no rights to touch that whatsoever. At least if I was in control, you know, 
So, uh, so I hope that the, that the buzz around the Knights of the Old Republic is just from fans and not from Disney actually having any plans or not, unless it was just a re-release of the game, you know, a nice anniversary edition on modern platforms and stuff with some, some better graphics, you know, or, or um, at least just a visual, you know, retooled or remastered or whatever. Oh, unless your Disney is in hot soup right now. Yep. And they made their own bed. They made their own bed 100%. You can't feel a bit sorry for them. They, you know, they had every chance along the way to stop, turn around, Hey, stop. Hey, you lost money there. Stop. Turn around. Hey, maybe you're going the wrong way. Hey, there's a cliff. There's a cliff. Oh, you just jumped off the cliff. Can't really feel sorry for you <laughs> at all. <laughs> and then, uh, and even going down the cliff, they're still trying to go forward. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's nonsense. So that's my, my little star Wars rant. Melissa Harris says my son, Jake is, has got the Marvel living mummy hero clicks. He's also got Marvel's Frankenstein Werewolf by Night and Dracula uh, Man Manphibian. Manphibian, cool. I do have the Dracula or the Werewolf by Night. Let me see if I can, um, you know, as long as we're talking about it, I'm going to stand up. You're going to see my Batman pajama bottoms, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to go show you my uh, my Marvel horror stuff. It's Halloween. Tis the season. Let me grab that real quick. Yes, yes. All right. <laughs> Sir Torin game. Well, at least we know he wears pants in streams. That's right. That's right. Uh, I do have the Marvel stuff. Got a couple things to show off. As long as we're doing show and tell here. I don't really have much of a plan for this pre-show. I did look at some cool art, some uh, some um, He-Man art that we'll get to. I'd like to prep it a little bit more before I actually show that, but uh, but we'll see. But uh, I'll see if I get to that in a second. But yeah, you talk about Werewolf by Night. Yeah, maybe this is the one he has, Melissa. Tell me if it is. Soft covers. I wish I could get the hard covers. But this is that uh, there was a collection. They only put it out a few years ago because I remember using it as content for my um, my 31 days of Halloween that I was doing. But yeah, the Werewolf by Night. Let me go back to my stream yard so I can see what I'm showing. Yep. Werewolf by Night uh, in color. And it's a collection of all of the, the you know, Jack Russell's transformations and whatnot. Really cool. And, and I love the Werewolf by Night story. It is a classic, classic werewolf tale and even me not really a horror fan what i love so much about the marvel classic horrors that they did was they really tapped in to the classic monster stories you know the classic the pathos of these uh you know monsters with their dracula their werewolf by night they even did some frankenstein stuff you know but really good uh good stories and the, and the evolution of of Drac of uh werewolf by night and of course you can't gotta have the team up gotta have the werewolf by night meets dracula tomb of dracula that was really cool so yeah the werewolf by night I have the, got to speak about it, the Tomb of Dracula. Excellent. And this is the, the volume one, too, which is, maybe they put out more volumes by now. They probably have because I got this so many years ago. But, uh, yeah, trying to get the glare off of that. And this, I believe, yeah, this is in color, too. So it's it's the beginning. It's, you know, when they wake Dracula, going to the castle and whatnot, and then him coming back in the 70s. Fan Man has, has, a, uh, has a really cool comic book adaptation of the novel which is not in continuity with Tomb of Dracula necessarily, but, uh, but he, he showed that off one, one year on Halloween. It looks really cool. It looks like it's, um, I mean, really like step-by-step, step, you know, uh, an adaptation of the, of the book, which is pretty cool. So, uh, so love that. Love the Tomb of Dracula. Still need to finish it up. It does get into some black and white too. So they're not all in color, but I think the, the original comic was told some in black and white and some in color. And I, I love that the, the early Marvel horror did evoke the old horror comics a little bit. And then, of course, Blade. Most people don't know that Blade originated in the Tomb of Dracula comics. That was where he got his start. So there's the original Blade. Very cool. And then, of course, the last of the Marvel horror is the horror, the horror magazine collection. And this is black and white because that's what these uh, these were. But you can see Tomb of Dracula there, Blade in the front, uh, Satana over there. They're, they're, uh, I think that was their Frankenstein-type character there. But, yeah, you've got all of them here. And uh, this is good classic, classic horror, you know, monster kind of stuff. There's some color, color covers in there too, I think. 
yeah so this is what they would do they would do like the, the classic covers in those magazines and whatnot but then the interior was black and white but very cool very cool stuff there's a nice background to it but yeah lo love that classic stuff that's that's the best and I will say, though, let me check with the chat and see if you've got any comments about this before I show off my favorite Halloween comic read. Every year I've got to read it. It's so good. Check in with folks here. Let's see here. Marvel's Living Mummy. Yeah. Yep. Disney's firing 28,000 people right now, Casey Scott. Makes sense. Makes sense. Doesn't surprise me at all. Hmm. Owen says the top three horror-themed superhero movies I love are Blade, Van Helsing, and Underworld. Underworld's amazing. Um, Kevin Grievous, or Grievo, I forget how you exactly pronounce his name. I met him at a con once, and he was talking about you know, his, his uh, pitching of that idea and everything like that and, and the writing of it and stuff. And um, That was a really great series. I, I need to watch the last installment of it, or last two, I think, I missed. But that was good. Van Helsing's fun. It's not a great movie, <laughs> but it's a fun. It is a really cool, fun idea. I even liked, if you like Van Helsing, the movie, <clears throat> did you see the animated prequel they put out at the same time? Remember at the beginning of Van Helsing, you've got <clears throat> Van Helsing and his, uh, his friar sidekick, I forgot his name. They're, uh, they're chasing uh, Mr. Hyde in Paris. And Mr. Hyde has this comment. He says, uh, or, or Helsing says, I missed you in London. And then Hyde holds up his arm and it's like a, um, a hole in his muscle there or something. And he says, no, you didn't, you know, and he's got the holes there. Well, the prequel, the animated prequel tells the story of the, um, of when he, when he, you know, had that interaction with them in London and everything like that. And that was actually pretty well done. I enjoyed that animated prequel too. So it was good. <clears throat> Check in with, uh, all right. So yeah, so that, uh, I will show you, you know, you guys know I'm a huge Alice Cooper fan and I do. I always try and pick up comics that have Alice Cooper in them. Um, uh, Welcome to my nightmare. This is, let me go back to the stream yard so I can see what I'm sharing. This is a hard, uh, just a collection of some of his uh, stories and everything like that. Really good stuff. Uh, has uh, Vincent Price, Dracula, you know, different. Um, it's so good. I love Alice Cooper as a, as a, but he's not really, he's not really, he's just a character in this. He really doesn't have anything to do with these stories, like the writing of them. Uh, that was, that was Marvel, I think. That was Dynamite. And then, yeah, there's some more Dynamite. But, uh, Alice Cooper chaos. You know, he licenses his, his uh, you know, he still has creative control over like the stories. You can say no and whatnot, but he's got really cool, uh, really cool car comics out there. But what I, what I recommend everybody read, especially if you like the Ray Bradbury stuff we've been doing on the channel and the Halloween tree book that we're going to start next week on the book studies. But Ray Bradbury, you know, we did uh, something wicked this way comes last, last year, which is one of my top, I would say it's probably one of my top five books, favorite books ever. At least definitely in top 10, maybe even top five. It's such a great, well-written book. Well, Alice Cooper is, of course, a, a huge classic, you know, in a horror fan, but literature fan, stuff like that. And in the 90s, I think it was like 94, if I'm not mistaken. Let me check the... He actually, and I've talked about this before, he converted to Christianity, which is a big deal. Alice Cooper, the shock rocker, you know, converting to Christianity... And everybody thought, okay, what's he going to do now? You know, he's, he's converted. Is he going to come out as a Christian artist, you know, and put out just uh, like yay Jesus songs all the time that are just kind of stale and all the, about the same thing? And the answer was no. He's going to keep doing what he's doing. And he did it. He changed some things, of course. There were some things about his show that he would tame down or, and, you know, not do. And he had just sort of a moral aspect to these, like, uh, the moral horror stage shows and stuff. But he kept being shock rock, kept doing those hor hor horrific stage, you know, stage shows. But he, he he added that moral aspect, and his next album was called The Last Temptation, one of the greatest albums out there. In fact, I think it's the best uh, concept album. I know people will throw a fit, you know, Pink Floyd or or uh, the Who fans will, will try to argue, but I, I loved it. I think cohesively in terms of a story. And what he did with this album was that he teamed up with Neil Gaiman. <clears throat> he, uh, before he even wrote the album, he teamed up with Neil Gaiman because he loved the Neil Gaiman Sandman comics of the day. And they together came up with this concept and they together came up with the story, the basic idea of the story. So then Alice Cooper went with his, uh, you know, his, his songwriting uh, cohorts there and, and wrote the songs about it. And it was such a great album. He worked with, he worked with some amazing uh, artists. He worked with Chris Cornell of Soundgarden, co-wrote a couple songs and sang uh, background. Uh, some of the members of the damn Yankees came on with him and stuff. He, he had a great, great uh, lineup and it was a wonderful album. T check it out if you're a rock fan. But so he did the album and then Neil Gaiman wrote a uh, three part comic story and it's called The Last Temptation. 
it's it's Michael Zuli to the art, and there's the cover for it. And and I love if you liked, and they, they it's it's supposed to be evocative of Ray Bradbury. Something wicked this way comes. In fact, there's even a scene in it where the boy has on his uh, school desk uh, something wicked this way comes. So it's supposed to be you know they're they're paying homage to it, but. It's really cool. Alice Cooper himself is ta is uh, cast as the showman, you know, the uh, the tempter, the, the demonic type character trying to tempt the little boy, who's Stephen, of course. If you know your Alice Cooper lore, you know Stephen's a big character. But Alice Cooper is like Vincent Fernier is, is is Alice is the real Alice Cooper. That's his real name, and he created the character of Alice that he plays on stage. So the Alice Cooper, the theatrical Alice, isn't the Alice Cooper that you see in interviews or anything. You know, that theatrical Alice is the character. That he works in, you know, to things, but uh, but it's so good. There's the Michael Zuli art. And this little boy like uh, gets uh, tempted by this stage show that's in town, and uh, very, like I said, very reminiscent of of uh, something wicked this way comes. But let me show you some elements of the the showman there. Yeah, it's just so good, so good. And I remember the the CD cover had like a little fold out. It was a sort of a um, a pitch, like a, a teaser of this. You know, could go out and buy the. The real thing. I, for a while, the only um, I don't know why they would have done this. They 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 sent a whole uh, uh, black and white version of it. It was awesome. It's really good, really good. But um, here's the oh, I love this part. This is when the young the young boy decides he's going to start fighting back because he's being haunted and, and trying tempted by this. And for Halloween, he puts on the Alice Cooper makeup around his eyes and says, "Okay, now let's see how you like it." <laughs> it's so good, so good. I love it. And it all takes place on Halloween night, you know. So it's just a perfect Halloween read. I love it. And I definitely highly recommend it to anybody who uh, who likes Halloween stuff. Maybe especially if you're like me, you're not really a horror fan, but you do love those kind of moral tales, like a Twilight Zone type tale or something. Or you know, this is very much akin to that. It's perfect. So I like the uh, yeah, good stuff. Anyway, that's my recommend there. Check back in with the chat. Yes, Casey Cut. Yeah, his dad was a Baptist preacher. He grew up that in. Uh, yeah, he grew up in Detroit, and it was funny because they, uh, he and the rest of the original Alice Cooper band, Alice Cooper was his name, but it was also the name of the band. So they were an actual band for the first five or so albums before they broke up and did their own things. But um, but they were all like Letterman in high school too. They weren't like the the geeks or anything, you know. They were like jocks for like on track and stuff like that, which was odd. <clears throat> but uh, but yeah, they um, they did that and and. Uh, the original band still did some great stuff. In fact, if uh, if I have any other Blue Oyster Cult fans in here, Blue Oyster Cult's a great band. There's a band uh, in which um, the original founding members, some of the founding members of Blue Oyster Cult, Joe and Alex Bucard, who were the brothers uh, that played drums and bass for the Blue Oyster Cult, they joined up with Dennis Dunaway, who was the bass player for the original Alice Cooper band, and they formed a band called Blue Coop like C O U P E like the car is like a blue coupe and it was um cuz it was Cooper and then blue from Blue Oyster Cult they blended the names so Joe Bucard switched to guitar and Dennis Dunaway continues to play bass and Alex on drums of course so it's just a three the the a trio and they all do the y'all share the singing um responsibilities and they're really pretty good you can look up them Blue Coupe on uh YouTube and see some of their stuff that's pretty good too and uh, some of the other band's members did some great stuff too and they would reunite with Alice occasionally playing on his records and stuff but his "Welcome to My Nightmare" was his first solo album as a as a solo artist after the band. I think that was his first one. Yeah, pretty sure. Anyway, checking on down. Oh, and says, I'm always wondering how one can balance the horror genre and superhero genre and make it work without sudden tonal shifts. Yeah, yeah, and um, characters like Moon Knight can do that quite well when when written properly, you know, and uh, certainly. Um, Morbius and, and stuff like that. So yeah, they're good. That is a good question too. You, you know, when you have a blended two genres like that, how do you, I think the key to that, the key to good writing, any, any like blended genre story like that, that doesn't have abrupt tonal shifts is to figure out your story, your plot line first. Then, then you can see what, what different genres it placed against. You can always tell if a, if a story is written to with the intent of trying to weave in and out of these two different genres, that's when it falls flat. But, uh, but you know, like Ant-Man, Ant-Man is such a great movie and it blends a superhero genre and the heist genre because it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's obvious. It's, it makes sense that Hank, uh, 
or that Scott Lang, you know, is a thief, you know, and, and you know, the lore and everything like that. So that works, that heist aspect to it. And Hank Pym is the mentor and that works too as a redemption of the hero character and stuff like that. So it's great. Really great. Uh, Troy's talking about the Hyde um, incarnation in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. You're right. It wasn't a good incarnation of Hyde, the character from the comics. But I did like what they did with that character. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers, but how he fits in, who he's related to and stuff. And the slight-ish redemption in the end they give him. Well, they do give him, but it's you know, it's kind of there's a certain thing behind it. Yeah, I like I like the character in the story, but you're right, it wasn't a proper telling of the character for the comics. Madden says that's because superhero isn't a genre, it's a subgenre. In a way, and uh and in some of these cases, I think that's right. But in terms of like the American monomyth, no, it's a pretty uh, yeah, I think you can argue that it's a genre too in terms of the American monomyth. So if you if you're gonna tell a spy story or something, for example, you still need to have the story that American monomyth setting of a character who rises up and works outside of the institutions of society to achieve the good or overcome the threat and then fade back in afterwards and maintain purity of, of you know character and whatnot. <clears throat> but uh but yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying too. So <clears throat> Excuse me. Pardon me. Check the time here. Good. 936. So, um, yeah, I've, I've got some some He-Man art that I, I think, I, especially at this point, that I've gotten so far into the stream. I don't. I think I'd probably rather save that until another uh, another time when I can come up with a little bit other art. I found some of the great epic fantasy art that was done uh, with the original um, concept artists. So before the before even the filmation cartoon, when they were still doing concept art for the characters and the figures and stuff like that to try and sell them with. Uh, really great, amazing art of, of He-Man in action and stuff like that. And even after the filmation cartoon came along, you know, some of this art was still done. And it uh, it's, it's really epic. It's some great good versus evil battles. And I wanted to find some, uh, I wanted to, to get some comparisons. So some comparisons of classic art, because a lot of people look at pulp art or, or art done for, for action figures like that. And they automatically think, eh, that's uh that's subpar. It's not real art. You know, it's too commercial or it's too dumbed down or anything like that. Absolutely not. They get masters in there. They get real true artists in there. And you'll even find a lot of artists who did art for like the Pulp Fiction magazines back in the day are ashamed of the art they did, but they're highly trained artists, highly trained artists who were just taking the job that they could get in the day. And you go back and look at some of their art and it's amazing. It's wonderful. It's uh, the skill and the things they brought to it. So I want to find some classic art renditions of classic battles, you know, throughout the Western Civ and then combine those with some of the He-Man stuff like there. So I didn't get to find a lot of examples of that yet. But that's one of the things I want to do before I show that. I will show off, though. I don't know if uh, if you can see behind me too well there, but I, I do. There used to be blank wall back there, but not anymore. Not anymore. Let me see if I can bring up the camera a bit. You see that there? That uh, right, there's the uh, there's the top half of the Fortress of Solitude. But let me get out of the way. I got that Captain America Civil War. That's an actual like poster size of the of the actual um, theater. You know that you take one. I got it from Disney Movie Rewards when the movie came out. I had enough points, so I went ahead and got that. But that is now uh, that is now in the in the back corner there that was so bare. So now I need to, to fill in a couple of little gaps on that wall, and that'll be done. Then I'll start working around the uh, the bookshelves up there and filling in things and stuff. But I need to cover that awful air conditioner. It's an old air conditioner. It was like cut into the wall. It doesn't even work anymore. It's not how I cooled the place, but. Uh, but it's there because there's a hole cut in the wall for it. It's a cinder block wall on the outside there. So I uh, need to cover it up with something. I had the picture there later or earlier, but go back down with that and get the focus there. Clear up. There we go. Okay. So back to the chat. <clears throat> AJ Boomer says, when are you going to give us the tour? As soon as I straighten up a little bit more. <laughs> I didn't make my bed today uh well i was i was washing the sheets too so try to do that at least once a week but uh yeah so i need to i need to, I need to make it all tidy over there and then i will give you the tour of all the the proper the pictures and everything up there and, and all yeah everything's covered in and geek memorabilia in here so uh so yeah i'll give you all that so you see the 89 batman over there and the and the, the couple anime posters over there all you you 
eager weebs in the chat. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Almost just says, even amazing artists need to pay the bills. That's why they do art for toys, games, and advertisements. Yeah, and it's, it's of course, I mean, that's fine. Do it. But stop pretending that the art you do for those things is somehow not art or not, you know, good enough. It's amazing, you know? Own it. Agent Member says, I got posters for Ponyo and the Wild Rises with my Disney rewards. Oh, okay. Yeah, I never saw Ponyo. I, I heard things about it, but uh, never saw that. I did get a lot I, I, for, you know, but that was but when, when the MCU was still worth supporting. And I would grab up every cool. I've got the Black Panther theater size over there. I just don't have a space for it yet. Um, the Ant Man, even the Ant Man and the and the Wasp, you know, little the Guardians of the Galaxy, the the Avengers. I actually have that right here. It's the um, can I take that down? All right, I'll take it down. I'll show it. There's a whole set of Avengers like movie uh, specific Avengers movie specific posters that came out, and I got the whole set. Uh, one of them's here. Let me see. Stream where I can share it. Got Iron Man there. And it says, I survived the Battle of New York. You know, from the Avengers movie. The cool one, too, I can't quite reach is up there. But that's the one that has uh, the, the silhouette of the Hulk taking uh, Loki over his head and slamming Yoki into the ground. And the, the pun on the top says, puny god. You know, from the... Uh, that's such a great scene when Loki's like, stop! I am a god! And <laughs> the Hulk just, like, totally... Man handles him and walks away and says, Pewdie God. <laughs> this is awesome. So, uh, Troy Vitelli says, I'm going to figure, I'm trying to figure out what that book is facing us over your left shoulder on the floor. It looks at a distance like Teen Titans cover. You mean over my, my left? Oh, on the floor. Are you talking about this over here? This is my, uh, this is the paperback version of uh, Air to an Empire. Are you talking about the one back there that's uh, leaning up there? <clears throat> Can't quite tell what you're talking about. Jedi Master Zetopia, welcome, sir. You need more Spider Man stuff. It doesn't matter how much you have, you need more. Well, you can't see it, and it's way too big for me to take down and show, but I do have the uh, right there. Let's see, I wonder if I can probably do this much let's see go up here and then try to swivel around there is my that hole in the wall there is where i, I just took down the avengers one from but there's the amazing fantasy spider-man and i've got some more stuff too but that's that first uh first cover appearance from the amazing fantasy before it was even its own its own comic oh and that was the last issue of amazing fantasy 2 the only way that Stan Lee was able to fit that in or sneak his Spider-Man character in that no one else would let him do. So I'm going to reframe that right. But yep, I've got more of it. More of that stuff around. Lots of good, some good Spidey stuff. <clears throat> Trish says, yes, back there leaning. Oh, oh, that is actually Graham Nolan back there. Yeah, Monster Island. I think I've shown that before. Uh, Graham Nolan did a Kickstarter for uh, the Monster Island gonna bother me this isn't hanging back up now but i'll, I'll fix it later <laughs> it's uh graham nolan's monster island graham nolan of course the wonderful uh batman artist that worked with chuck dixon for so long amazing amazing artist and he actually did the um did ha, wrote, wrote this own story of his called monster island that never got picked up or it never was completed i forgot how it went you know and published back in its day but he did uh, a kickstarter for it and i actually backed for the actual um uh, collector's edition, which is that big one you see back there. It's glorious. It's glorious. I can, I can show you if you want, but uh, yeah, it's really good. It's it's about this um, these two pilots, this guy and a uh, man and a girl, a man and a woman, these pilots who get stranded on this lost island of these uh, prehistoric beasts and, and tribes and stuff like that. Sounds kind of cliche, like it's been done a million times before, but he actually does some really cool, uh, really cool original stuff with it. So <clears throat> I always get the framing wrong when I try to fix the camera there. There we go. It's a little better. Owen Lister says, One of my favorite lines Captain America said before jumping out of the jet to go after Thor, there's only one God, ma'am, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. Yeah, I love that line. Yeah, because Black Widow says, I've sent this one out, Cap. These guys are basically gods. There's only one God, ma'am, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. I love that. That was so beautiful. Great. Such a good movie. Such a good We've do, we've done a rewatch before on my channel, but I'm going to do a rewatch again. I, I would actually very much like to do a rewatch of that movie 
even though I know there are movies that come in between them, I'd like to do a rewatch of that movie back to back with Age of Ultron. Because even though Age of Ultron isn't as good as the first in terms of artistic uh, or, you know, whatever, it's an amazing film. And I get so tired of hearing people's BS criticism of it because it, a lot of it's just unearned. It was it was it was a really good movie. And Joss Whedon weaved some really cool themes into that. And, uh, you know, yes, of course, he'd make changes from the comics. I get those as legit, legit criticisms. But in terms of the movie itself, the quality of it, really, really well done, really well done. Agent Boomer, where do you keep your issue number one of Spawn? Yeah, don't have anything like that. Don't have anything like that. I did read some Spawn back in the day. A friend of mine was uh, was really into it and had a bunch of issues, or his brother did anyway. And I remember being over there for the weekend and read them. And yeah, you know, it was a cool concept, but not really my thing. You know, I need more heroism. I need more heroes <clears throat> to uh, to really you know follow it and stuff like like that. So it was uh, don't really have that. But, you know, a lot of Superman on my wall, as you would imagine. A lot of uh, Batman, Wonder Woman. But I've got some Marvel stuff. I have uh, some original art, too. You know you know about my R.T. Bear Superman there. And I have a uh, Matt Weldon Scarlet from G.I. Joe on the wall there. It's with Keung Lee uh, from his uh, Battle Maiden Knuckle Bomb over there. So, yeah, I've got some originals. I do have a Neil Adams that's signed to me, actually, at a con. A Neil Adams Superman there, which is pretty sweet. And some Mauricio Abril, of course. And... Uh, even a Des Taylor Iron Man. So yeah, got some stuff there. Jedi Master Zetopia. The Age of Ultron comics were not good. The movie is vastly underrated. I agree the movie is vastly underrated. I never really read the whole comic saga. I did read, you know, a few of the, the issues that were re-released, you know, around the movie and stuff like that. Like I said, I grew up as mainly a DC person, not a Marvel. So Marvel was something I came to later in adult life. But uh, but I like, you know, the aspect of the comics. I mean, uh, the the the... The big, the biggest change that the movies made, of course, was that Tony Stark created Ultron and not Hank Pym. Hank Pym was supposed to have a real hand in that, which is why Ultron's head looks very ant-like with the antennae and stuff like that. They try to tone it down a little bit for the movie, but you still see some holdover in that, and that's because Hank Pym was creating sort of another version of his suit, you know, in that in that AI, you know, um, creation. But uh, but I like you know for the for the terms of the MCU and how they built it up to that point. It did make sense to have Stark be the one behind it for that character development to grow, and it, and it brought so many cool uh, conflicts and and uh, moments, you know, that that, that of course uh, set the stage for Civil War later. So when Tony Stark and Captain America are having that conversation about it, and he's like, uh, you know, what about when the ultimate threat comes, the ultimate threat to our planet? And then Cap says, we'll face it together. He's like, what if we lose? He's like, then we'll do that together too. You know, it's all about being together and standing for your your um, principles, you know. <clears throat> Let's say Harris is Amazing Fantasy 15, August 1962 cover done by Jack the King Kirby. An art story by Steve Ditko and Stan Lee. You know about the Spider-Man one? That, was that 15? I forget. Yeah, it was 15. Yeah, exactly. And uh, in... in Stanley wanted to do the character, but they wouldn't let him do it because they thought no one wants to read about a teenager superhero idiots. But they said, no, no, no. So he decided to slip the story into the final issue there of Amazing Fantasy before it was over. And uh, it was so hugely popular, but that was the final issue of Amazing Fantasy. So that was done. So then he says later, the editors came and said, hey, remember that that Spider-Man idea you had that we all love so much? Why don't you go ahead and give that give that its own comic, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, you know, another another case of the actual writers, the artistic creators, knowing what the audience wants, knowing what, what sells for good story, and the overlords, the editors or corporate, you know, film producers or whatever are, are clueless and, and doing it, you know, horribly. Oh, this is the Age of Ultron isn't as good as the first film, which I agree. It's not quite as good as the first film. Uh, it's still well made and fleshed out the characters more. Yeah, it does so many great things thematically, too, with... Uh, with the themes of, of creating life and what is your responsibility to that work or generation you leave behind. So you do have the Pinocchio themes woven through it and you have the Frankenstein themes woven through it. And you have that aspect of what is your responsibility to the next generation? What is your responsibility to the work that you create? Even as an artist, you know, you can look into that as well. And that's that theme is all through it. There's that wonderful, wonderful scene when they first face Ultron, in the Avengers Tower there, and then they realize he's uploaded himself, so he's actually not, they didn't destroy him, he's gone, 
and then you have that factory come alive with all of the, the copies of him and you have the uh the the, the avoid the the uh sound over of pinocchio singing there are no strings on me and uh that's that's pretty cool but the, that theme carries out even beyond that little um you know kind of on the nose moment of showing it in fact when they're in korea at the doctor's place where she's um she's uh ultron's trying to to recoup to coop her and and uh, you know hypnotize her and stuff with the with the staff and whatnot um uh, they fly in and they fly in over this famous sculpture that's uh two individuals reaching out and touching each other but there's a frame around where their fingers are touching so you see it's a mirror or it's sort of a pygmalion like art meets artist um you know cool so so that that whole theme is woven all throughout it in the visuals if you know what you're looking for and it's uh cool in the story too let's see um yeah jedi masters utopia that's that's why endgame is such crap that's a perfect example of why Endgame just Endgame just completely all the problems that we talk about in Endgame. One of them that we don't say as much about is how it just completely mocks and picks fun at the wonderful universe that it is set up. That whole part when they go back in time, especially when they go back in time to the moment of the Avengers, you know, when Avengers ends, it's horrible. And and, and Cap's like, yeah, it's America's ass, and. It, they're so out of character and it's so it's suddenly about self-deprecation like you don't want the this is the, supposed to be the movie that was supposed to be the culmination and the crown jewel the the, the keystone of the wonderful build-up that you've done through over 10 you know 20 years or whatever um 10 years i guess it is or whatever it was supposed to be amazing and they just they just didn't even try they just took the easy way out they they just kind of threw stuff at the wall to see what would fit and they made fun of all the great work that had been done. And it was uh, everybody involved in that movie should be ashamed of themselves. I don't know how the directors, the Russo brothers, still think they made some great piece of work there. Um, not so. Really horrible, horrible ball drop. Epic ball drop to what could have been the most amazing thing ever. Should have been. But nope. Nope. Complete. And yeah, Leah Plus Size. Insult to the character and us fans. Absolutely. For all of them, yeah. So, yeah, you, uh, yeah, that was after short, shortly after Disney had purchased Marvel, I think that uh, Age of Ultron was created so they could do that kind of stuff and use the rights and stuff like that with the Pinocchio song. Yeah. Age of Boomer says, yeah, they ruined, they did, they ruined Thor. I don't understand how anybody can defend what they did to these characters. And the defenses I've heard come from an emotional defense so so people for example who have dealt with like ptsd in their life and they're like oh i saw what they did to thor it makes so much sense I, that's so real that really happens okay good for you but that's not supposed to that's not that's not what you're supposed to see in a superhero story you're not supposed to see the superhero go through realistic ptsd for crying out loud at least not a hero like thor now, you could see Iron Man go through something like that in Iron Man 3. That was legit. In, in Iron Man's archetype, that's fine. That is something he would face. Not Thor. Not the man who's, you know, no, no. And you can't do that to all your characters. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. That was such a boneheaded move. And that was just the writers thinking, hee hee, it'll be funny to show a fat Thor. They won't expect that. Everybody will laugh. And, you know, it got his silly little laughs. And Rocket got to say his, oh, you look like a melted ice cream cone. But that was dumb. That's the problem. So, so talk about you know Owen Lister's question earlier of how you know um, are, are talking about like hero horror comics and how do you stop tonally abruptly shifting from one genre to the other? That's that's a that's an example of that. How Endgame tried to marry the Guardians of the Galaxy lighter, funnier tone with the Thor more epic tone, which had already been shot to you know everything with with uh, Taika Waititi in the previous film, but then with the Avengers they they. The cool thing about the MCU was it was superhero stories as other genres all building up to this. And in Endgame, rather than just choose one and go with that, they tried to work in all of those subgenres. And it was just a big mess. It was a tonal mess. It was horribly paced. It was uh, uh, all over logically, story logic. And it was a ridiculous, horrible treatment of the characters. Watching it all the way through, I was so thankful... Well, no, because Captain America didn't survive with that stupid America's ass comment or whatever. But uh, 
but it got me on board a little bit just in the theater that initial theater experience when you know they they finally showed cap lift the hammer that was amazing and that dumb stupid stupid ending they gave him just abandoning everybody so he can go live with peggy dumb dumb there's no defense for it stop pretending there is there's no way in the world he gives sam the shield stop pretending that makes some kind of sense just because it fits your ideologue values it's a horrible film horrible film truly horrible yeah, Troy, yeah, Thor already had his PTSD arc when he earned back Mjolnir. That was done. He completely undid all the development after all that Thor broski. Yeah, the, yeah. And even they started it in uh, in Ragnarok. Now, I don't hate Ragnarok outright. I'm not a fan, man. Uh, I think there's some good stuff in Ragnarok, and I think there's a good movie within Ragnarok that's just covered up with a lot of the ridiculous Taika Waititi nonsense. And it was so popular because of that Taika Waititi nonsense appeals to your mass public who just wants that visceral thrill in the theater just make me laugh stop making me think you know that kind of thing but uh but there was a good movie there's a good arc for what does thor do when his hammer's taken from him later in life he doesn't and he because he has to decide at that point right do i do i revert to the thor i was before i was worthy of mjolnir or do i uh do i do i keep going and he keeps going and then uh and, and i like the arc in in uh in infinity war of him eventually getting stormbringer that's great but no not interested in uh in in, in ptsd thor broski that, that was that was utterly a fail in every way definitely yeah and, and thor like giving up the, like his whole arc was about being worthy king of the asgardians and then in the end as uh jedi zootopia is talking about yeah uh giving that up look here uh you know valkyrie you're a better you're a better king than i am i'm just gonna go explore space with the guardians for a while and join in their silly comments to each other so they can clear the way so jane can be thorette you know nonsense madanui says i mean endgame's whole reason for existing was to undo the events of infinity war seriously that movie is why i didn't care about infinity war's ending yeah yeah you know i'm, I'm re-watching the mcu with a friend now and uh and, and we're gonna stop we're gonna stop before Captain Marvel. We'll probably watch Ant Man and Wasp because that doesn't tie into anything. We just won't watch the end credit scene, you know. But uh, but yeah, when we get to that point, it's over. That's that's the story. It's done. Unfortunately, there's no more because they dropped the ball so hard. Leah Plus says, says what they did to Steve Rogers was far worse. Hate with a passion. What they did to him. Absolutely, I agree. Could not believe that was the Steve Rogers I fell in love with. Yeah, it's awful, and it uh, it's even more heartbreaking to see Chris Evans who at one time I would have argued was very much on the noble path of what a heroic actor should be, uh, rising above the nonsense of the day and just really trying to portray a good hero, visiting the children's hospitals and stuff like that. But he just decided to, to comment on contemporary politics was far more important. Now he's sharing inappropriate pictures online, and he's just completely epically fallen on his face. He's no longer a uh, an actor worthy of that kind of role. I'll still always honor and, and cherish his uh, his portrayals of the character, which were so iconic. But uh, but he's no more, he's no more a uh, an, an icon or a, somebody worthy of that character. Just looked at the time, and we are we are just about over. So let me go ahead and take a break now. Put the screen up and uh, and set my little movie set up here. Bring in the panel so we can go ahead and get started with the mummy. But uh, but thanks for hanging out with me, guys. Even if I had no plan whatsoever, we we filled the time. Good hangout, good conversation back and forth. So that's always fun. And uh, got to do some show and tell, which is always good. So uh, let me go set this up and I'll be right back. And then we will start our uh, our Mummy 1932 rewatch.
All right, I'm back uh, as I usually do for these rewatches. I do want to start off before I bring the panel in by showing off my the mummy version from this Universal collection. So I've been doing this each and every time, but just again, this is the uh, legacy collection that Universal released when the Van Helsing movies came out. So when Stephen Summers released the Van Helsing movies, which were him, what that was his uh, weaving together all the other Universal monsters, you know, uh, back into his uh, new retelling of it <clears throat> after the mummy movies. So he's got a lot of content on here. Each one of these where he does uh, background stuff and whatnot. But there's the look of the mummy version. Again, that uh, that screen there. It's a box. It's a slip box. I like the looks when they used to do these. So, you know, it's got the, uh, you know, the pyramids. That's part of the cover. And then you slip the mummy face in there behind it. So pretty cool. But then uh, you open that. And that's a nice hard, hard uh, <laughs> Professor Geek ASMR. <laughs> oh. It is, it's closes too. It's really going to protect your discs, but it's uh, uh oh, that one came, came undue. Not that great protection, then, huh? But I've got the one in there already. But you see, the background is uh, is her on the slab there, about ready to, to come back and be re, re uh, um, possessed and whatnot. And down the bottom, we live today, we shall live again in many forms, shall we return? And this has the mummy. The uh, <laughs> it's got a theory, uh, a, a secret special content mummy dearest, a horror tradition unhearth, unearthed an original documentary, a film historian. Oh, cool, nice. Uh, but the movies has the mummy's hand, the mummy's hand, uh, the mummy's tomb, the mummy's ghost, and the mummy's curse. So it's got all of them there, pretty cool. But yep, that's my uh, legacy collection. I think Troy has these as well that he's watching them from. I think he's got the mummy one too. He'll tell us here any moment. Let me uh, see. Go ahead and bring in our. Let me get rid of me here, and then bring in our uh, our panel. So, with me as always is my trusty TA Big Al. Say hi, Al. Hi, Al. And we have the uh, Klingon cleric himself, Mister Troy Pacelli. Welcome, Troy. Hey, how you doing? And yes, I do have the the legacy collection, but mine was the collection where they all came together in one slipcase. Oh, okay, got you. The whole big one, yeah, nice. Uh, and then our our guest host for uh, for this uh, this month, I think, or however long he wants to be here while Sound Engraver is uh, taking a break, is our Mister Agent Boomer himself. Back to the channel for a second time. Welcome, Agent Boomer. Uh yeah, thank you for having me. Great, uh, great thumbnail there too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's of the uh, the leading man in this movie. Um, that's yep. David Manners' as Frank. David Manners. Yep. Very cool. Is uh is Nutter joining us tonight? Troy, no, or? she's not. After the problems that she was uh, having with last night's stream and uh, you know her computer and everything, and she also figured, oh, you know, you know, we got we got a full crowd here already, so she's just going to bow. She is here though. Okay, you know, she's, she's still hanging out hi. with us in the chat. Yep, exactly. Want to remind everybody to definitely uh, go to her channel. Let me see if I still got the link on my copy. You know what? I'll drop to, uh, it. Okay, cool. Yeah, drop that. Uh, her. Her first video is up on her channel, so give Netters Network some love uh, if you're if you're new to the stream, if you haven't stuck with us through the pre-show. See, Arcade Burns is here with us again, too. Good to see. Let me show uh, Troy's thumbnail off there, too, for that Mego figure, for those interested in the Migos. That is the Mego, right? Or Actually, this is the uh, the slightly older um, MC figure. The The Mego figure is a very generic. Uh, I guess they didn't have the likeness for, for Boris Karloff for it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they just went with a generic Egyptian mummy. I wanted to show the one from tonight's, you know, film. I yeah. have that one too. Uh, really quickly, chat. Let me know. I didn't. I didn't refresh my stream yard before I brought everybody in. So let me know if it sounds like I'm talking over them or they're talking over me or something. That would mean that the timing's messed up. But just let me know in the chat if it sounds good or if it sounds off, because I can fix that. Al, I know the you. Um, oh, first, let me tell everybody I do have it paused as I usually do um, right at the beginning. So, in this Universal Legacy collection, I had to wait until after the modern Universal logo. Yeah. And then I hit pause immediately right before I guess the classic Universal logo. Is that what came up next? The That's little, what I'm seeing the, 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 the plane, plane coming around the earth. Little plane. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Sorry. The plane. Um, the, the plane. plane. <laughs> Now, Al, I know, uh, I think I've heard you say that this is probably your favorite of the Universal Monsters. Hang on. Yeah. I've, 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 oh, always, I, I've always oh, liked dust. Karloff's, Karloff's uh, mummy, uh, Imhotep slash Arneth Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, 
I don't know. I just I I dig I dig Egyptian imagery. Uh, I like I like mummy movies. Uh, there are some really good. There's a few good bad ones from the early '80s. I'm sure very few people have heard of. Uh, one starring Charlton Heston, by the way. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's um, I I uh, I can agree. It's not the best Universal film. That that uh, to me goes to uh, the Brian Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. But uh, he is my my favorite mummy. He is yeah. uh, my favorite monster. What is it about the the movie that that speaks to you so much? Because I heard you talk so much about it. Uh, well, I just I just love Karloff's performance. There's a there's something about a man who would go through what he did for the woman he loved. Mm -hmm. I mean, he risked literally everything and just and was going to wait an eternity to be with her again yeah and, yeah, there, yeah. and there's something there's something uh and you know me and beauty of the beast kind of uh those, oh yeah those kind of uh themes but uh and this one just was just a, it's more romantic i'm sure to me than it is to probably to the, the more casual viewer mm -hmm. uh because like i said there's just something to be said about a man who would uh, wait that long for the woman he loved, and, and it's kind of uh, oh, you could you could almost uh, put it in the same category as Doctor Who's uh, Rory and Amy, uh, the mm. man who the man who would wait two thousand years wait, waiting for the woman he loved to return, uh, uh, protecting yes, the yeah. Pandorica, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So uh, that's uh, it's just that's just a th uh, theme I've always appreciated. Plus, you yeah. know, uh, just another great makeup, uh, and, and even more complex makeup that uh, Boris had to go through thankfully only like a couple of times because well, hey, t t t tell us that during the movie I'd, I'd rather get okay. those, those cool Sorry. trivia things as we start yeah, watching yeah, yeah, you're getting me on you're getting me I know on. I know let's, 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 not let's get this movie intro. going I know I know <laughs> well I wanted to give people I do want you to talk about that definitely I just want to save that for the rewatch <laughs> I just heard an agent or changed his uh... <laughs> oh sorry yeah I, I was doing the first one it's kind of a I, I hate the leading man in this. I, oh, really? Always, okay. He, he bothered me when I was a kid, maybe because Karloff's the main draw, right? And, and and we have to have the nice leading man in there for the for the for the young young pretty actress. But it's just I I he always got on my nerves, and I said I have, I have to change it. So that's all. Okay. No <laughs> yeah, just, Bramwell, um, Bramwell Fletcher for those who are wondering. Yes. Well, uh, I think uh, we seem very eager to talk about this movie, which is great, but I think we probably should go ahead and get it started then so we can keep the commentary over the film for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, anything else we need to cover before we start? Everybody queued up? Anybody need a couple minutes? Excuse me. Uh, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Yep. Sorry, there was a little bit of dust on that Universal or that uh, uh, the top of that Avengers picture that I took down. And it, uh, cause it's, it's, it's high up on the wall. So that there's a little dust on the very top of the frames. So when I took it down, it's right here, still under my nose. And this get my allergies a little, a little crazy. So I was trying to yeah. keep it under control here. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. There's something in the air. Like my eyes are watering tonight <clears throat> yeah. for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> I get allergies too. I, I never did used to, I guess it's old age creeping in. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we will go ahead and uh, get it started. But uh, those new to the stream or watching for the first time in the replay, I'll say three, two, one, play. And on the word play, that's when we all hit the button. And this is available to rent in the usual places if you don't have it already or you're not a pirate like Al. And <laughs> it's, <laughs> on, it uh, it's on the Internet Archive, I believe. Okay. So, uh, so yep, yeah, you can grab it there. And uh, if anybody needs a timestamp as we're going through, if it took you a little bit to, to get it, Download it or grab it from somewhere. Just let us know. We'll, we'll shout out a timestamp for anybody. Otherwise, let's go ahead and start. So uh, here we go. Three, two, one, play. Love that you classic. Realize, of course, I want the plane to be in that plane. Off the earth, they all suffocate. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> right, I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> Al, what were you saying? <laughs> I saw I want to be on that plane. Oh, okay. And, uh, H -B, did you say something too? I was just saying that they'd suffocate that high up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they suffocate anyway because there's obviously no atmosphere. There's no right, clouds. Exactly. Or I just realized I, I didn't have the audio off here. Oh, okay. I was wondering who that was. Okay. That's me. Um, okay. 
the same piece of music that they played in Dracula, Swan Lake. That's right. That's absolutely right. Actually, I'll say this. I don't think it's copyrighted, so you're okay, right? Swan Lake, right? <laughs> That's true. Well, maybe the performer. I don't know. I don't think so. I think I'm good. I just uh, I neglected to turn the audio off the TV to get it to play through the headphones instead, so uh, I was using the, the TV this the weekend. Cast, in the cast there, they have listed a guy named the, who played the Saxon Warrior. Uh, his part was cut. Yeah. So he, he actually he he's forever noted in the film, but it's not in it. Oh, huh. scroll of Toph. Herein are set down the magic words by which I missed it. Oh, Amun Ra <laughs> of God, God of gods, God. death is but the doorway to new life. We live today. We shall live again in many forms. We shall return, O oh mighty one. So, of course, when they were making these films there was no real idea or concept of the blended universe and that didn't come up until later when they decided they wanted to start having these characters interacting mm -hmm. um but i you know i I'm, i've got my 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 facebook group where i'm trying to you know reimagine you know how how we could you know someone who actually cared about these characters create a, a new shared universe for them this is where it would start right it would start in mm -hmm. ancient egypt and my thought always was that imhotep messing around with you know magic and uh the gods and so forth is the one who brings this anti-life if you will this undeadness undead magic that unbalances the world uh, into the world you know because you were talking in the pre-show about zombies and vampires and and mummies and so forth they're all undead it's all this unnatural messing with the the natural balance kind of thing i think what what is so uh, intriguing and what why the the ancient egypt keeps coming back into our consciousness uh, monster movies and whatnot and other other kinds of movies adventure movies is egypt is a a uh, a source of a lot of western civilization if you take any class on western civ you're, you're, you'll start with ancient sumeria and stuff like that but you're going to get and spend a lot of time in egypt long before you even get to greece and uh so we have that aspect and so we've got the uh the aspect of the curses from that time or the judgment coming about from that time and that is the uh you know it's a judgment on modern day society on, on antiquity coming in and judging modernity you know and True. True, true. Uh, so that oh, my, oh my goodness, Van Helsing! Yeah, okay. he's played in, played in all these movies. Yep. Uh, one thing to note: the mummy that is in there right, that he's touching right there, wooden. Oh, really? Oh, okay. The the, uh, the only time Karloff was ever filmed is like in extreme close-ups, and oh, when, okay. basically when he was opening his eyes and actually moving, all the rest was was a wooden dummy. I wonder if someone still has that prop. Oh, oh man, God, that'd be amazing. That'd be yeah. That whole setup would be awesome to have. <laughs> I, I like the bit where the uh the one archaeologist says, Hey, more is learned from broken pits of pottery and then this more sensational finds, and you're a, and I'm a kid and I'm like, I don't care. Show me what's, <laughs> show me what's in the box. Okay. I want to see the big mummy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's like going to the museum on a field trip as a kid, and they're trying to tell you all this stuff about Egypt. You're like, where's the dead guy? <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting here is you're getting all of the – you're basically getting an exposition dump here that's mm -hmm. giving you some of the – their speculation on what is actually the backstory for Imhotep. Mm -hmm. And I think – I like the way they did it in you know, the, the Brandon Fraser version because you actually see it. Mm -hmm. you know yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think one of the things that probably uh, helped them get away with the exposition in the day in the theaters was that people already knew karloff they knew him he was a monster so just by seeing his face back there even though it's wooden they don't know they think it's him back there they know at any point the tension is when's he going to get up and walk up behind them you know right. so i think that's, that's keeping true. people on the edge of their seats a little bit when's he going to get up and go for a walk <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah uh, but yeah at this point uh, after Frankenstein, he no longer really needed to use Boris. Mm -hmm. You you just said the word Karloff, and that's all yeah. you needed. Karloff. Karloff the Magnificent. 
I've been watching this uh, show on National Geographic, Lost Treasures of Egypt, and the modern archaeologists always complain about how they used to unearth things back in the day, and, and I'm just yeah. looking at this now, and I'm thinking, yeah. how much are they doing? And stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, I was watching a, a similar show where some archaeologists were going through, I mean, and it looks like the warehouse you see at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where there's mm. all this stuff just you know, put away and cataloged. And Nanette made a comment like, man, it's it's kind of tragic that all that stuff is just, you know, put away and nobody's looking at it. I'm like, yes, but there's a reason for that. They want to take it slow. They they don't want to just go in willy nilly and then forget everything. So it's better to put it aside and keep it logged and archived until the uh, ready. And there's always someone who ignores the curse. <laughs> well, exactly. I love this setup because you've got the funder there, the one with the full power in the middle. Then you've got the archaeologist of that science and expert, but then you've got the one who's an expert on the actual history and culture, and he's warning mm -hmm. them. So you've got culture warning the science. And, of course, the science isn't going to listen and get itself in trouble. Common trope in monster films. Yeah, my, my favorite line of, of this young man, though, is a few thousand years is enough to take the mumbo jumbo off any old curse. <laughs> and, that, and that's used later on in like uh, like other horror movies. People use the word mumbo jumbo and they're not buying into the, you know, I'm not going to use the sacred candles so the zombies don't attack me. I'm just going to kick them over. That sort of thing. Yeah. You know? so. But, you know, like you were saying a second ago, Troy, with the cataloging and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It is good because it preserves history but it is sort of a it feels kind of like a blasphemy or something because it takes them out of the context of their culture you know I, i'm glad you mentioned that too because that was something that a modern archaeologist addressed and they said specifically they very are very keenly aware that this is a dead body this mm -hmm. was someone who was buried so they mm -hmm. still try to respect it the way a mortician does with a modern body, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with the family and stuff, even though they're separated from their family, anyone who ever knew them by over a thousand years, you know, don't do it, Ralph. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> <He's tempted. laughs> like I said, you always have the ones who like, are like, take like, don't do it. And then you have yeah. the ones that are going, so, well, no, you know, everything will be all right. And then you have the butthead who actually does it. Well, you got to have your impetuous Pandora at some point yeah, here. So. A little, the, it, it literally, yeah, literally, it's like it's opening Pandora's box. Uh, Lisa says, "I thought well, the mummy was the bad guy. How is this a mirror of Beauty and the Beast?" Well, it's a it's a um, Beauty and the Beast type. It's not it's not a mo yeah, mirror of that story, play for right, play by any means. He is, right. you know. Yeah. And and you know, although you can you can project a certain amount of nobility on him, the fact is. You know what yeah what he was going to be yeah. doing to the yeah character later on was not a good thing he he uh he betrayed his king and he, you know mm -hmm. he was a murderer yeah, before, and, you know yeah. he's still not a good guy yeah. this is great though talking about ramping up the tension because if you notice they've gotten they've had a lot of scenes of them with their back to the casket and again the audience knows Karloff. they know that's him in there Mm -hmm. So they're waiting for that moment. And now they've reduced it and ramped up the tension by just having one person in there alone with the casket. And now he's reading the forbidden, you know, so it's, it's come a scroll. Now, of course that scroll is the wrong type of paper, but <laughs> he's still treating it like, Oh my gosh, gotta be careful. This is very fragile. I like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course the reality of part of it are just crumbled, but. Yeah, something that old. Exactly, exactly. P Papyrus would have held up better than that pulp paper that he was using, but yeah, you're right. It would still be. Now, I never thought. Did the Egyptian? Would the Egyptians use animal skin like a vellum? I thought they would use more papyrus. I don't think they use. They, vellum I know they would use papyrus. I was just wondering if they, uh, if they at any point would use a vellum. I, I know that just, they. Just just wondering. <laughs> I, I know that they used it as a wrapping. I don't know if they used it as, you know, something for carving on or writing on. It go. took, I think, eight hours to do his makeup. Oh, yeah. Talk about the makeup. Yeah. Now that we're watching it. Uh, yeah. The great Jack Pierce. Of course. Uh, who, of course, uh, would do, uh, um, of course, Frankenstein and the Wolfman and 
like all all the great ones. Uh, it was like layers of cotton that were were glued were glued to him to get that that thing, and he had so much on his face he could not move his the muscles of his face, which is why even oh wow if you looked at side by side he looked like a wooden dummy because there's just nothing nothing was really mm -hmm. able to move. And he really, this that is bridge the, out of his mouth too again, right? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Thing? I've yeah. never really heard about that, but. Um, like I said, this is the only time you see, yeah, this makeup. I love that, just the hand, and then the horror. And uh, this no, is that a is classic, classic. And he went through to think about Carl. You got to give Carl of credit because he he was a pretty okay guy. He went through the entire process, wrapped foot to toe, foot to head, mm -hmm. and that's all you see. Yeah. Can we give some props to this actor? This is probably one of the most. Absolutely. Um, I mean, second probably only to Renfield. I mean, it's that. This is the kind of thing you 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 get in a in a um, cosmic horror, you know, Lovecraftian thing, where mm -hmm. he his mind just snaps from seeing something that should not be, you know. Yep. And this was sort of thing would happen in Tales from the Crypt comics a lot. You right. find the guy stark raving mad at the end. This yeah. is almost a, movie, a little movie into itself, just this beginning part here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see the, the little bits, uh, the print. Yeah. I, I Yeah, you're right. Uh, that could be just that intro could be a little Tales from the Crypt comic. Um, now, and now, of course, they tell you it's now 11 years later. Now, I did want to add on to what Al was talking about with the makeup. The the um, adhesive they use, the resin, mm -hmm. is a resin that, that I still use today called uh, Rigid Collodion. And what it does, it's got a high alcohol content, and it dries. It literally dries and causes your, your face or sur whatever surface it's on to kind of pucker and mm -hmm. dehydrate. So it's <clears throat> kind of uncomfortable. Now... It's usually used to make like a scar on the face. Um, mm -hmm. And I've used it and, you know, it's, it's a little itchy. So I can only imagine what it would be like yeah. be covering your hands and your face. That guy's a trooper. Yeah. <sighs> now, was this movie a reaction? I think I read somewhere about the, uh, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. Yeah. Uh, yeah at, at King Tut's. The discovery of King Tut's tomb was a huge story in the twenties, mm -hmm. and he famously uh, disregarded that curse. And oh yeah, and, well yeah, yeah, you could extrapolate from that and you know kind of blame things on it. But uh, Universal having such success with vampire with a vampire and a, and a monster, they wanted a mummy movie. They wanted some kind of like ancient Egyptian thing, and there really wasn't a, a book like there was for Dracula and Frankenstein. Right. So they kind of created one, although it's very much, uh, it's very similar to a story by, I think, is it Stoker? Seven, the Seven Jewels? Yeah. Jewel, yeah. Jewel, Jewel the Seven Stars. Um, so, yeah, Jewel the Seven Stars, yeah. yeah. Now, I love this look. Mm -hmm. I would be so comfy wearing this. <laughs> <laughs> Be nice, loose, and airy, and have my little fez. But like I said, except for the makeup that you'd have to wear. <laughs> yeah, because he he does have that wonderful leathery look. Yeah, but he, as a monster now, he's quite is quite different than any other monster because he's just acting and, and interacting with people as normal. But mm -hmm. the audience knows his origin because they know that's Boris. Right, they know right. that's, that's exactly they know, they know who it is, but he's no physical threat to anybody right now. So it's a very, it's a unique, it's, it's a mysterious kind of monster. The threat of well, it is you kind of get that a little bit with Dracula too, though. That's true. Yeah. And the stoker influence coming from, yeah, him. at least initially. Yeah. Now he doesn't like to be touched, right? That was the thing that came up a few times in this film. <laughs> yeah, it's an Eastern prejudice. <laughs> uh, but our Ardeth Bay uh, is the name re rearranged it as Death by Ra. Oh, cool. And of course, it, it, it's uh, our Death Bay, B A Y. In the Brendan Fraser mo movie, they have 
an Ardeth Bay, but it's both of them are spelled with an E, which to me kind of just you know kills it. Uh, yeah, kills yeah. the acronym or the uh, not acronym. What is it? And it's, uh, a, and it's a totally different anagram. character. So, yeah. Did anyone here ever dress up as a mummy for Halloween? No. Uh, no, no, that one I didn't. Yeah, that one I did in the second grade. That was a complicated costume. But uh, I bet. Yeah. Well, it would There's be always... more difficult this year because it's hard to find toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. No, I would love, I would love to dress like Art F. Bay. Oh yeah, and have, you know, the fez and the the long, uh, over thingy, whatever it's, I forget what whatever it's called, and, and that ring. I love that scarab ring. I need yeah. I. That's one of the things I want to I want to buy myself one day is that ring. I need to find one that actually fits. So here we've got, you know, so before in the intro scene, we saw the uh, science disregarding the culture, disregarding the religion, the ancient mystical, you know, curse. Mm -hmm. And here we have science again, the uh, the the uh, foreigners coming in and and uh, kind of, quote unquote, raping the land, you know, and digging out that you know, Egypt's own cultural elements you know you get the people they're hired to work but you still have that aspect of science disregarding the culture and that's where the judgment comes from there really was a, a great deal of that um in the the late 1800s early 1900s um mm -hmm. you know the victorians actually used to smuggle um mummies out of egypt and they'd have mummy unwrapping parties mm -hmm. yeah Mummy, uh, pat, they ground up mummy bones. It was supposed to be an aphrodisiac yeah. for the aristocracy. Oh, uh, I did forget. Oh, I did forget one thing. The uh, the look of uh, Imhotep before he became Art of Bay was kind of. They originally were going for Seti, but it really came out more like Ramses the Third, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they they were actually using. Uh, the historical mummies to get their look. Oh, cool. Were you going to say something, Angie Boomer, a second ago? Or? Oh, I was just just looking at this museum, though. I was thinking, uh, when I was a kid, I was begging my parents to take me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Me Metropolitan Museum of Art, not Art, in mm -hmm. uh, New York City, just because uh, that's where all the Egyptian stuff was kept. And I, I saw it in this movie. I was like, I want to see this stuff for real. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no, I mean, I, I was obsessed with this movie as a kid. I, I was on a real Egypt kick. That's why I wanted to be the mummy for Halloween. Cool. cool. And, uh, I had all the universal action figures. The mummy figure was unique in that it was a whole figure. They all had glow-in-the-dark paint on them, except for the mummy. The entire figure glowed in the dark. Oh, right. nice. Yes. Uh, the lovely Zita Johan. Mm -hmm. I should we have... Uh... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say we we our our museum of science and industry here in Chicago is a really good Egyptian uh, section and and they've got a mock up so that you can kind of see what it would be like to go into the into the tomb and look down into the chamber to see the the skeleton. Oh, I mean, nice! The, the mummy. That is cool. Oh wow, cool! I we had a. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I left my I left my Universal Monster action figures in my office at the university, but I do have a mummy one too. I could have showed off, but that was all. You go ahead and say something smart. <laughs> oh, I'm saying, uh, even in Florida at St. Petersburg, there's a museum that they got some great exhibits. They had a Tutankhamun. There was a traveling Tutankhamun traveling exhibit, and they had him there. Unfortunately, I missed it. I was in school at the time, but uh, uh, later on they had a Vatican exhibit where they had uh, relics of the Vatican there. That was really neat to see. So mm, yeah. Cool. So even if you don't live in the big cities, usually something will come to your area if you keep an eye out. So they, they do have traveling exhibits. Arcade Burns has shared his uh, museum story. He said, I took frequent field trips to the Rosicrucian, and the teachers had to constantly remind us the docents and tour guides were top Egyptologists, and we'll see mummies and crypts soon. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> sit through their talks, and you'll get to see the dead people. <laughs> <laughs> Staring on his beloved... Yeah, there's something kind of uh, it's creepy, but it's also kind of sweet. Right? It is. <laughs> I, I, I mean, think about what he went through. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I really don't like the leading man in this because I feel Karloff is sort of he's the one that she should belong with. That's I always mm -hmm. was was born on his side, even though he's 
I, I guess we have to show him as the villain later on. He has to, he has to kill somebody, yeah. right? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, no, but I mean, it's well, he, not just somebody, a couple of them, but not. well, yeah, but they were, you know. I was, hate to were, be the voice of feminism here, but what about the girl? Doesn't she get to choose? I mean, uh, see, that's, it's, well, that's the whole, you know, that becomes an issue. You know, with, you know, Helen is like, it's my choice. I, I need to do what yeah. I want to do. Actually, and naming her uh, Helen too, a little bit of Helen, a Troy reference well, there, yeah. even though it's the different culture. It's the same story. They're piggybacking on with that name choice. Does she get a choice in the matter? Does she have a say? so professor geek what kind of monster would you classify the mummy as or does he have just have his own classification maybe i don't know uh he's the mystical zombie type you know whereas like okay. i was saying uh melissa harris brought up the the similarity to frankenstein i was talking about in the pre-show that uh both portrayed by karloff and both um the dead returned but frankenstein comes back through science the mummy comes back through mysticism and uh <laughs> That's a whole other part of the human psyche that can be explored in monster movies. So I'm glad they did it. And I am glad they did it with the same actor because it does link the two. But if you'll notice, if you see pictures of the universal monsters, the top three are vampire, Frankenstein, and Wolfman, you know, because of the, they're just so archetypal. But if they expand it out at all, the very next one they include is the mummy. Mm. The, uh, <laughs> the interesting thing about the way these kinds of, creatures are dealt with in dungeons and dragons is you have your different archetypes of characters of hero characters and if something happens to your character and they become an undead creature depending on what your class is depends on what kind of monster you become so if you're a priest and you become an undead you become a mummy if you oh, are if you are a warrior, you become a skeletal warrior. If you are a paladin, you become, um, I, I don't remember what the, I, there's some kind of an anti-paladin, I, I forget. Um, mages become, um, uh, what are the, the, the magical, with the phylacteries, um, liches, mm. and, and, and so forth. No. Ziva Johan, I imagine, I don't know much about her, but I think she didn't she have a pretty good uh career even in silent film before this? Uh not not especially. This this was kind of her biggest her biggest yeah, role. This was her big okay, because uh oh, I might be messing up with somebody else. But you do uh yeah. with this actress and a lot of actresses that were cast in those days, you really wanted expressive faces, which was a bit of a holdover from the silent film era where they really have to act through expression and whatnot because they don't have the sound. Mm -hmm. But Zita Johan, those beautiful big eyes to really show her being hypnotized and so much expression on her face for a character who doesn't have a lot of agency, she can really push push it through otherwise. Yeah, they um sa sadly she kind of felt uh uh bullied on set by the director. Oh, I remember hearing about that, yeah. Yeah, the dir the director uh, she thought he was setting up a scapegoat if the movie bombed. <laughs> he could say, oh, you know, the actress was just so hard to work with and whatever. But of course, you know, the the film was a huge hit. But she just got so dis, uh, disenchanted by it that it, it literally, you know, she just really didn't do a lot afterwards. I mean, she went on for a few years. It might have been, a, and she might have had completely valid gripes. I don't know much about that story, but I remember do watching the interview, and she struck me. She didn't, she didn't strike me as uh, very empathetic about the whole thing. She struck me as one of the sort of modern feminist types or whatever. Um, like maybe she might have had maybe, a totally maybe, valid maybe, deal. But, yeah, because um, uh, yeah, there, it, it's one of those he said she said kind of things. Because mm -hmm. um, one of the stories she, they were going to. Uh, the director said, well, what if uh, if you, we have you do a nude scene? And she was like, and he thought she was going to like balk about it. And she's like, okay. Mm -hmm. If you get it past but the we should, we should mention that Carl Freund, the director, since we're talking about him, this was the cinematographer on Dracula and Metropolis. Mm -hmm. I mean, so he has a really yeah. great uh, name and, and list of, of credits already going into this as being, you know, trying his hand at directing. Yeah, it's really, yeah, this was his, his first uh, shot at directing. Cool. 
Oh, well, I you, want... can, and you can definitely see the cinemat the cinematography eye he brings to it too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I just wanted to mention Leia Plus Size What's has a comment. Uh, Leia Plus yeah. Size has a comment. Uh, I saw a great documentary on Karloff about his work and the making of this movie. I think it is on Amazon Prime, so that might be hmm. worth looking into. Yeah, mm -hmm. it might be the one that's on the special features. Oh, maybe. Uh oh. <laughs> Here we go. Don't mess with your and, mummy. And that's that's great. <laughs> not not being seen, you know, having it seen off camera and just her the mm -hmm. killing and the thumping and the gasping. And that's that's more horrific than Yeah, I have the captions on it says body thudding, uh body thudding. That's what it says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of uh, Tales from the Crypt, did you guys ever see the Mummy episode of the show in which the uh, the two couple archaeologists, they discover a mummy who comes to life, and they end up playing strip poker with it to kind of like as a way to bide their time? <laughs> yes. Remember that one? And the, the, guy, one. the guy keeps losing once the mummy learns how to play, and he ends up wrapping himself in the wrappings because he's so cold. And then he has to stay there as the mummy, and the mummy escapes with the girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, have to I'll see. Let's see. That was based on one of the comics because they usually adapted. adapted oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I also like the one. I think it was Tales of the Dark Side film with Christian Slater. Yes. You using the electric knife. Yes. <laughs> I thought that was just a brilliant way to take care of a mummy. Yeah, and Steve Buscemi was the guy bringing the mummy back. I remember that. Yes. So it is very, it's very Stoker-ish, you know, and again, from the story, but you can see elements of Dracula here too with the the woman who's affected and then mm -hmm. all the men who kind of form a protective circle around her and the monster trying to get into her. And there's, there's something archetypal about that too. Again, like I mentioned with the Bride rewatch on Troy's channel last night, with woman being the... Uh, symbolizing the the she's our heart of culture you you look at historically anytime a civilization falls it's when they stop treating their women with respect or when their women mm -hmm. lose any kind of sense of honor the civilization ends up falling eventually from a cultural standpoint and uh so so a lot of these stories have that sort of feminine our femininity is being that what should be protected and, and uh you know cherished or whatever kept from the monster who's trying to use use the feminine for his own means even though you've got this sort of love story with the mummy he's still doing that with her so, mm -hmm. so what you're saying, professors, our civilization is on a decline now. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the the whole quote unquote women's live is just about tearing femininity down and, and deconstructing it and yep. um, yeah. sterilizing um, it. And you know, we were we were talking about uh, Zita, Zita Johan after this film. She only did. She's only got three credits past that until uh, which. It, it, 33 i mean 34 and then her next credit is from 1986 raiders wow. of the living dead wow wow some, some weird little horror, <laughs> horror film that was you know i gotta watch that now to check it out. <laughs> interesting I'll, this oh, i'll look forward to that review <laughs> interesting this conversation where he's talking about finding the, the 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 woman the mummy and he said unwrapping her like oh, you found me silly but i almost fell in love with her face this dead face you know but the <laughs> preservation of it you know uh green lion girl's here welcome green lion girl <laughs> melissa Harris says to quote courage the cowardly dog i love that cartoon <laughs> <laughs> return the slab or suffer my curse each night you shall be visited by three plagues each worse than the last return the slab <laughs> Isn't there these two actors similar sim similar looking? Uh huh. Um, Which I don't know. Well, they're both old. To yeah. me, the uh, the the not the Van Helsing, but the other guy reminds me of Martin Landau and Ed Wood, Tim Burton's Ed Wood playing Bella uh, Lugosi. Yeah, oh. and, uh, Arthur Byron is mm -hmm. the actor. Arky oh Burns. my gosh, he does kind of have a Bella Lugosi look to him, doesn't he? Especially Martin Landau's rendition of him. Yeah. R.K. Burns says, I do remember the Tales from the Crypt with the college students and their Egyptology professor who had a replica tomb of a mummy under his house with the real mummy. Oh, yeah, that was another good one. 
And Are Green Lion Girl bring up Are You Afraid of the Dark? Love that series, and they had to they have a good mummy episode. It's find interesting p- different police uniforms in different countries. Mm-hmm. Mm. Local authorities. Like that look of dread. Yep, he remembers <laughs> that that scroll. And he you was know, the I, one that disregarded the warnings before, too. Right? Mm-hmm. I remember when the guy was reading the translated scroll in the beginning. I always, when I was a kid, I would always, I, I remember turning up the sound, trying to figure out if I could make out what he was saying. And, it, you know, to no mm-hmm. avail, obviously. <laughs> Why, you want to try raising a mummy? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to find yourself some tannin leaves. You're ki- yeah. Oh, oh, wait. That's, that, that's in the sequels, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 The other mummy series, yeah. Right. Yeah, Karis. Yeah, Karis. Uh oh. Now through her, it will strike my son. And it's his undo because he he disregarded the the Mm -hmm. warnings to begin with. It's it's the beaches of the Fourth of July and the shark all over again. Nobody (laughs) ever pays attention to the warning. Now that dark, as she's in there alone again, building tension. Now we're talking about that before. Mm -hmm. So now we're connecting the dots with that scroll and what's going on with the mummy in the temple or in the uh, museum, the Vestal Virgin. And this was made in 1932, right? Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. The year my mom was born. Sure. That's how I remember when the mummy was made. <laughs> my, Your mummy was born. <laughs> my mummy was born in 1932. <laughs> and I, I do like, because I watched, as a child, I watched the Brendan Fraser mummy before. Watching at, the, I didn't watch this until older. I love how his eyes almost have this like light up. Yeah, the cinematography background of the, yeah. the director. Yeah, um, but it was cool to see the uh, the beats that the the remake did take, even in its re envisioning. Mm-hmm. Really cool. It's interesting you say that because I was the opposite. I used to watch this one over and over again as a kid, and I saw the uh, Brendan Fraser one when I was uh, my early twenties, and I'm just mm-hmm. wondering. I'm wondering if uh, did you find this boring going from the Brendan Fraser with all the action to this, or did you still appreciate this on a different level? As a child, I might have, but since I watched it as an adult, I was already right. loving the the archetypes and the you know the classics and stuff like that. Now, as a teenager, that's when I first started getting into classic movies, so I probably okay. would have liked it then. But as a child, I might have found it boring. Yeah, like it's it's more for an adult sensibility. But now, that, how old were that, you when you? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, that's sl- it's that slow burn the atmosphere it's like i said it's it's not about you know going through a desert and evading sandstorms it's yeah yeah this how old of a child were you when you first saw it did you remember that you were so taken with it no i i don't i was in the second grade so what was that seven eight probably around oh, okay. then yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started watching all the Universals because I was always interested in horror, but the, of course the modern horror movies would give me nightmares. So, mm-hmm. but I found the Universal ones more accessible. You know, they were safer. I would guess I might be the. Of course, if you think about it, at the time they came out, they probably weren't considered safe. They were probably pushing the envelope when they came out. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, I can imagine audiences seeing Karloff's hand rise up in this for the first time. <laughs> they probably would have caused screams. Oh yeah, people. yeah. This was before they got into the the cheap scares. This is very much more yeah. cerebral. Yeah. You, then they started getting into the jump scares, and you start going, yeah. Oh, you know. Yeah. yeah, it's it's about it's about the menacing. Exactly. As and opposed it's, to the sheer terror of that quick terror shot. 
And it's when the audience had an attention span and an audience could actually sit mm -hmm. there and follow a story and you didn't have to keep their interest with these stupid little scares and whatnot. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a chicken and egg argument. Did the jump scares dumb down the audience or the dumb down audience demand the jump scares? I don't know, but it is a the audiences today are, are truly ignorant and stupid. They, they don't have the attention span to sit there and follow a good story anymore. They need to be tantalized, you know, tantalized. I, I, I well. think that's the, the impression that Hollywood has, mm -hmm. but I, I do feel like some of the best received films are the thought provoking ones. Mm -hmm. And it's just like Hollywood isn't willing to take those kinds of risks these days. Oh, no and they risk. just assume yeah, no that their audience is stupid. Yeah. Everything and, and has I, to be a safe bet for money for Hollywood. Yeah. I, I have a theory too. I think maybe the people behind making these movies aren't as uh, smart as they used to be either. That's another theory. Very true. Very true. Very <laughs> true. You have a point there. Yeah, most of the the ones that do come out that that are more cerebral tend to be the independent films. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's oh, just those eyes. <laughs> I know. Talk about somebody who is really able to act through his eyes. Karloff was so good. I mean, just, you know, through all the makeup we talked about in the Frankenstein, being able to act through all that makeup. And I don't know what the what the makeup he has on his face now. You can tell his face is still pretty still. He's not moving much of the muscles of his face, but he's able to act through those eyes quite amazingly. Yeah, it was still, it was, he, he still had a lot of stuff on his face to give him that wrinkled look. But yeah, but yeah, you're talking about his eyes, but also his voice it has that deep, that deep tenor. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the right term, but the resonance. Yeah. I would say there's almost a bass to it. <laughs> <laughs> no trouble. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I thought about it. And I resisted. I had to. <laughs> Where's our sound engraver? She, uh, she'd peg him as a baritone or something. Did he ever do any singing? He did the the Mr. Grinch song, right? Yeah. Was that? Oh no, yet? that was Thurl Ravenscroft. He did this. Yes, the, that was oh, Thurl Ravenscroft. Right. I see. Okay. He was Best great. Name ever. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name, Ravencroft? Thurl Ravenscroft. <laughs> Actually, uh, Thursday on the iconic Universal Monster site, there's a short little clip of him and Lugosi singing a song called "We Are Horrible." We're horrible men. Oh, cool. <laughs> or something like that. It was on a radio. This past Thursday or just scheduled for this coming Thursday? I, I, I think scheduled for this coming Thursday. Okay. Well, I'll look for that. Yeah. For those who don't know, Al does the, you know, Troy talked about his fixing the Universal Monster, wonderful group on Facebook. And then Al uh, mans the iconic Universal Monsters Facebook page, uh -huh. posting images and stuff like that. So definitely check that out. So now they're connecting dots and implicating him. Now they have no way of knowing that he's the actual mummy, of course, but he might have been the one who stole it. It was interesting. I was watching a movie called Count Yorga Vampire recently, and th this one doctor who suspects this guy's a vampire. Do you believe in vampires and werewolves? And then Count Yorga says yes. And it's like, <laughs> it, it reminds me of the scene because it's like, <laughs> like you can cut the tension in the room. Like they both... The, they, they they both suspect the other knows, but they you know what I'm saying. It's yeah, just... yeah. <laughs> and that, there's a scene in Dracula, very much the same, with Van Helsing confronting Dracula, still trying to play it off as though he's just a regular person. Uh, and then eventually mm -hmm. that iconic moment where he shows up the crucifix, you know, and or when he was pointing at him and muttering those words, it was yeah. actually the words mean destruction. Oh, okay, oh. cool. And now that's all out on the table here. Mm -hmm. Tell that weak fool to get the scroll wherever it is. <laughs> now, did any of you see Frank and Weenie? Yes, I like that a lot. Tim Burton's, Both yeah. versions. Yeah, and I, yeah, the, with the Disney version, the feature length version, I swear one of the kids was doing, was supposed to be imitating Karloff. And mm -hmm. I think he was imitating this Karloff from this movie. 
Oh, the, nice. Because when his creature, when his pet comes to life, the gerbil or whatever it was, it was in mummy wrappings. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, I know he's doing Karloff, but it's not Frankenstein. Who is he doing? Oh, the mummy, of course. Mm -hmm. my yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you see, it still looks like they got a, they gave him a little bit of lifts to make him a little taller. Because I think I think he's only 5'9". Huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's actually not a super tall man. Troy just dropped the link. He dropped the link earlier to fixing the Iconic Universal Monsters group, and now he dropped the link to the Iconic Universal Monsters Facebook page for those mm, interested. Thank, thank you. Well, I guess with Frankenstein, he had big shoes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the, the tar shoes or whatever the construction workers knew that was saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is cool, uh, seeing the in his pool there, seeing the visions of where the scroll is. This is kind of an iconic scene for the months, for the, the mummy, him kneeling over his pool there. And how is he going to stop him from burning it? And a great setup for tension and conflict later is, is uh, he said, I want you to, uh, I want to, to attack you, but your power is too strong. And the fact that the mummy didn't even bother. He didn't bother attacking him or killing him in person, because mm -hmm. he's not just a kill to kill. He wants to, but he'll kill anybody in his way for his thing. Right. So he wouldn't attack this man until he decided to try and burn the scroll. You know, it does look like this takes a toll on him, though. Mm -hmm. Doing what he's doing, yeah. Good call. Yeah. yeah. It's not an easy thing to do. Magic has a price. Mm. <laughs> Love that fez. <laughs> My, keep talking about fez. Keep, that's all I keep thinking about is the Steely Dan song, the fez. You guys ever heard that? It was a it was a euphemism for safe sex. It was never going to do it without the fez on. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I think of the fez on Doctor Who. That's what I think of. Uh, yeah, fezes are cool. No, they're not. <laughs> I don't really get the appeal of fezes myself. I don't. They look kind of silly to me, but it's cultural appropriation. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're a Shriner. Oh, good point. Okay, so that's a particular culture, yeah. <laughs> so they they he switched it. They think the scroll is burnt. But... So so what is this like the equivalent of 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 using a cross? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the version. <laughs> Because yeah. the Virgin Mary uh, is is within the same archetype as Isis, you know, the mother, the divine mother of the divine savior reborn. Hmm. And she was really pretty in those Saturday morning shows. Oh, my <laughs> <Yeah>. Isis. <laughs> you love those. Yup. But I like it. We were, we were talking about when he attacked the, the guard, they say it was natural causes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't by bludgeoning. He does not do it physically. He he makes some natural. And that's interesting because the mummy in the wrappings is a very different kind of threat than this mummy. That's a visceral mm -hmm. zombie-like tear you limb from limb threat. This mummy right. is mystical and and uh, you know, threat within. Yeah, it's far a, more dangerous. He, he's like yeah, he's he's like he's a wizard. He's a mage basically. Mm -hmm. Not to mention crush your heart from a distance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now this is smart. He's removing the ashes, so that's good. Mm -hmm. Is that the little dog in the bottom of the frame there? It's like, what is what? moving? Oh, oh, it's a dog. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like a pillow or something at first. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me. This you remind you of like a flapper. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the hairstyle really makes yeah. it gives her that. Uh, I mean, nineteen thirty-two is hair. not too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that short hair. Well, if you look at um, like Dracula and Frankenstein, like all the ladies there had shorter hair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would be fun to do a rewatch sometime of the the Spanish version of Dracula. Um, to see some of the cool stuff they did mm -hmm. that the other one didn't. I still prefer the uh, you know Bella Lugosi one, but uh, but there was some cool stuff in the Spanish version. 
Yeah. Carlos Villaras. So now they're starting to get wise to the to the story. And when you're when you're fighting a mystical monster in the archetypal stories, you do need talismans for protection. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the crucifix, of course, for Dracula, and the, the Isis here for the mummy, and so forth. That was one cool thing I liked that the mummy, the 1999 mummy, did was adding the cats, uh, you know, as sort of uh, yeah. protectors of the of the under of the afterlife and stuff. Hmm. I actually like the the scene of the guy going through all the different talismans, looking for one that would protect. Oh, yeah. him. <laughs> Trying to pray all the different prayers. Can be sight beyond like, sight. Yeah, sight beyond sight. Because as soon as he got to the Hebrew one, he recognized the language of the slaves. The as he called the slaves, them. yeah. Yeah. Uh. And it's interesting. The dog is very a very Anubis like dog too. Oh you know? yeah, that's intentional. Yeah. Um, in fact, when he refers, you know, oh, the, the language of the slaves, I can use you. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but think he it's kind of like he becomes the mummy's Renfield. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> I am I was trying so hard not to have to do this, but I'm going to have to slip away for a second. I'll be right back. <laughs> That's fair. Tried so hard. Oh, the cat doesn't like the dog. <laughs> it's the age old story, right? Yes. <laughs> well, we all know cats are trying to take over the world. Dogs are trying to protect us. That if anybody's like ever seen cats and dogs, they'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Looks like a comfortable outfit he's wearing. Mm hmm. Like I said, light, airy. Yeah. Lots, of, lots of room to move. Hmm. See, I just found him more interesting than the lead. I don't know. The lead, I don't even know if the lead ends up doing anything really in this movie. The, the yeah, he, uh, yeah, he, he's, 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 he dotes, he dotes over, basically. That's about it, yeah. It, it, I mean, at least Brendan Fraser, he was a man of action. So I, I if I had seen that movie when I was a kid, I would have went nuts over it. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Love, crime, and death. What a great line. Yeah, that's in the trailer, I believe, too, isn't it? That that line, they have that in the trailer. And, you know, mm -hmm. I want to hear more about that. You know, you hear that line. Well, I love that smoke effect coming from the little vents. Mm -hmm. Of course, now we get his story of what happened to him. The one sad thing is that they actually had this whole, they had filmed a lot of uh, reincarnation stories for for Zeta, like she was like a medieval princess and all this other stuff, huh. and they cut all of it because they they showed that she was reincarnated over and over again. Interesting. You know, like like I said, they showed at the beginning the Saxon warrior. Oh, he got completely cut out. Huh. I guess that's in the missing scenes on the DVD. I'll have to check those out. All right. So that's his father, right? Mm -hmm. Carlos' father. Is that supposed to be his father? Or is that her uh, father? That's what he said. It said his father. So. so is his father like the high priest? Is that what's going on? And he's like a... I, I don't know. Yeah, well, of course, you know, Anaxanamen is a princess, of course. That's why she's getting this big thing. But he was in love with her. Mm -hmm. The priest, the forbidden love, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, when, as I was stepping away, though, I just stepped away when the dog was scared. And the Anubis, you know, dog, and of course, Anubis was the god who would guide those uh, dead souls into the afterlife. So it was sort of a god of that boundary maintaining it so it makes sense why the uh let's not have any communion with the boundary right now because we're coming back and forth from the dead i love that leopard uh leopard print stuff he's got on really good blocking and choreography there too physical acting because it's all framed and there's no dialogue 
yeah. in the actual scene. There's a voiceover, but now I have a question. If they're forbidden from using the scroll and, and reciting the words and all that, why do they have the scroll to begin with? True. Well, if, you know, it's <laughs> Is it like a holy relic? Is that what it was? And they have to protect Probably, it. Probably, yeah. It looks like yeah. it. Yeah. Because it's, it's a holy it's thing. Part of the god and stuff, yeah. You got the whole. Yeah. And this exposition is is it, at this point it's such a different type of movie than the intro was. You know, uh, the 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 sequels very much are kind of like trying to make a movies out of the intro threat of the actual mummy, you know, and wrappings and whatnot. But this is just such yeah. a different type of story. It's really cool. And with this backstory and history, I mean, this is you know. And it, uh, of course, they couldn't have shown so much in the 1932 version, but in the 99 version, they really show the torment and torture that the priest underwent in his death, you know. Mm -hmm. And in the Hammer version, they do one other thing to the mummy, which is cut out his tongue. Yes. Which is yeah, why the mummy doesn't speak. Version, you know? Yeah. I but it's still horrific just to be what, buried alive. But yeah, look at the. I mean, he, he's he's really emoting that fear. Yeah, as you would. I mean, my goodness. He's struggling too. He's not. Yeah, yeah he's bad, fighting against it. It's a bad way to go. I oh, uh, I would have um, it. You know, I, I I had shared earlier. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and share it again. The uh, in in my conception of the uh, fixing the universal monsters shared universe. I uh, f envisioned the first movie being all just this story set in ancient Egypt and mm -hmm. literally the ending of the movie being him being, you know, mummified and buried alive and seeing it. The, the, the last scene is seeing it from his point of view as they're closing the tomb. Mm hmm. That would be neat to see. That you, could put, you could put some I, Easter eggs for Dracula in there too, you know, from the time of uh, Budapest or where. Or that come that come that came later. Never mind. That comes later. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I knew deep, that. that deep bass too. Like, <clears throat> mm -hmm. But actually, what I was going to use to tie it together, besides you know the whole idea of of Imhotep bringing, you know, this, you know, God of death into the world and, and allowing there to be, you know, the undead and that kind of magic uh, is the gypsies. Um, mm. the, the, the term gypsies actually comes from this belief that their, their ancestors came out of Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then have those be the same, you know, they carry the lore with them throughout. Mm -hmm. So you have the gypsies that end up in um, Budapest and they end up in, in uh, Transylvania. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the gypsy that curses uh, the, the werewolf and so forth. I love that line. No one has ever suffered the way I have for you. Yeah. Well, he's not wrong. Yeah, he's not. And that's... Uh -huh. And I and said, that's what really like gets to me. That was pretty harsh too. They killed. I, I, oh, oh, that must have been where they were going to put that reincarnation thing, because right, right? he just mentioned about uh, your forms in other ages. Yeah, yeah. The I bet that's where they had. I bet that's where they had to cut it. Are you talking about the slaves, Agent Boomer? Oh, I was just mentioning it's harsh. They get killed. The soldiers that that killed the slaves get yeah. slain. It's mm -hmm. like they were wanting to keep this all under wraps. And to be fair, I think the Egyptians under wraps. I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they 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 would rewrite history a lot. I think they would they would hide things. The ancient Egyptians because they were. I remember a while ago they were trying to find evidence of Moses, and uh, they think a lot of those records got wiped in, in mm -hmm. ancient Egypt. It was seen yeah. as a failure. They didn't want to keep keep records of it. 
I mean, they did find some stuff that did corroborate the story, though, but <clears> like a lot of stuff was wiped. Mm -hmm. That is a great scene in Ten Commandments as he's walking away. Your name will be stricken yeah. from all the. From every temple or every erector. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> And that was obviously Wolfram. not everywhere because you didn't find her. <laughs> yeah, good point. And with, the, with their dog howling in pain like that, you know, they, they killed the dog or whatever, but that's the removal of that boundary between dead and living symbolically, you know, after the scene. He's dead, yeah. And it's nice that we see the scene of him, of her with the mummy there <clears throat> in uh, Emotep. And then we've got uh, the scene of her and the leading man that she's she's drawn away from him now. So there's conflict between these two now. Man, and he says, no more cinematic universes. They're a plague on movies. I don't think that's true. I Poorly just think, done cinematic universes are a plague. Yeah, on it needs to be well done. That's the problem. Even, you know, the Marvel universe was shaping up to be very good. Yeah. So far, so far, the monster verse, the Godzilla monster verse is doing fairly well. True. Good point. But I, I do understand what he's saying. I, I think the issue is if you have one bad link in the chain. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on how you want to look at it. I mean, on the other hand, you have one bad link. You have all the others to kind of keep the momentum going. And you yeah. can go, oh, you didn't like, you know, Thor Ragnarok? Well, that's okay, because, you know, there's a, another movie coming. Right. And unfortunately for the Dark Universe, the very first link fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Repeatedly. Oh, no. Because first it was Dracula Untold. That didn't work. So they said, okay, well, let's try it with the mummy. That didn't work. You got to have a plan, you know, that, that is such a, the, the universal, you know, especially the recent universal failure is such an example of the utter hubris of Hollywood. Yep. You know, they were going to do this shared you before the first movie even came out. They had the full cast of all these slated movies, taking pictures together and, and all this talk about what they were going to do. You got to do it first. You got to yeah. earn the respect and earn the right to make all those plans, you know? Well, there's also the problem of, uh, you know, the, the, the whole suicide squad effect. You know, mm -hmm. I've, you've yeah. heard me say this before. You put the, the cart before the horse by putting villains that didn't have a backstory and giving you all exposition mm -hmm. in order to get the story across. Yeah. Uh, just because you're trying to set up, you know, your next movie. Uh, the Mummy did the same thing. Uh, it was more about setting up the other movies than it was about doing this darn movie right here that you're working on. Yeah. God, and the, and the Mummy, it was so bad. Mm. I saw it. <laughs> oh. It was, I, I I was never looking forward to a movie more. And, well, there were others too, but, I mean, that one disappointed me a lot because I, from the trailers, I thought, okay, this might be good, and then, no. No, no. no. I could tell from the trailers it wasn't going to be good. Yeah. I don't know. I was hoping just, oh. Uh, it just, it, it it wasn't even bad in an interesting way. That's what was that mm -hmm. was what I didn't like about it. The other problem was setting it in a modern setting. You know, I mean, like I said, you didn't start with a story about the mummy set in the mummy's own time. Right. You didn't start, you know, you already had Brandon Frazier's, you know, set in the, what was it? The thirties, the mm -hmm. like 20s, 30s, 20s, 30s, 30s. So now you got the, the, the other death and love. Yeah. Dialogue between the two of them. I'd rather die than live and lose you. And I don't think, uh, especially since they, they, they didn't focus on the other lives thing. Something that's really missing is that what should have been a huge tragedy for this 
this immortal soul of hers. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're looking at it from a spiritual standpoint, whether it's Egyptian or Christian or whatever, there's this belief that you die and you go on to an afterlife. Mm-hmm. Her soul is trapped here by all of this mm-hmm. and forced to live life over and over and over again. And, and actually, Z, uh, Zia believed in reincarnation. She was into a lot of the mystical, the mystical stuff and the occult. Mm-hmm. She was a goth girl. She was a goth <laughs> girl, yeah. So where was Imhotep's soul? Bound up in his body, I think, because of the maybe, curse. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's always been there. Yeah. Huh. Because he was denied access to the afterlife because of the curse. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. What is bro? Gotta do it. <laughs> I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's strong. You know, we're all talking about what is what? Yeah, you know, the nurse Sorry. is kind of cute too. Too bad she doesn't get, get any credit. I don't know. Did you guys say what is what? Bromide. Was bromide was, but the chemical he gave, she gave her to sleep. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming it's a sleeping agent, but yeah, yeah. Like him putting the uh, ISIS around the doorknob. Now, just a scene like this of him quietly turning out the lights, putting the ISIS on the doorknob. Modern audiences, you know, at least I'm thinking when I think of a say modern audiences, I'm thinking like the kids in my class, you know, they'd never sit through something like that. Oh, it's boring. I gotta get and pee or something, you know, <laughs> but that's beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's setting, it's setting the tension because you know what's going to happen. If you've been paying attention at all, you know, Imatep has this, t- this power to reach out. And then it does, you know, cut to him over the of the pool, and uh, this is his romantic rival there, the one standing in his way, or guarding her. Yeah, I had a professor who used to used to make us so angry because uh, the students would keep going up to take bathroom breaks during a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will too. I get angry about that. They'll sit down and pretend to listen to a lecture for an hour and fifteen minutes, but you put on a movie. Oh, I don't have the attention span for that. I just watch TV shows <laughs> on Netflix that I can. And she said that black and white is a problem for younger people. That's what she said. I I don't know if that's true, but like she was saying that... that, For a lot of them, it is, yeah. yeah. It's like, I'll go to hip over your dead body. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But he did grab the ISIS just in time. Yep. Oh. We have some great promotional pics of her in this outfit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a great outfit. Yeah. Now that's her hair undone. Is that what we're supposed to think? I guess. I, I don't. I, I don't know. I, I gotta call fake on this. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I mean, yeah, it, it definitely is a wig. But I think his question is: Are we supposed to believe that it is the character's real hair? Yeah. 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 And I'm not entirely entirely certain because given the outfit that she's wearing it wouldn't it wouldn't be inappropriate for her to be wearing a wig Mm -hmm. as part of the costume right that's got to be a saucy temptation to the sensors there too with her leg and thigh and everything seen outlined under the sheer fabric like that this was pre haze code i am having a hard time looking past the shoulders and the top that she's wearing (laughs) <laughs> good, thing, good thing my eyes dart fast. Got that, I got that one crooked eye, so I can take it a lot more. I've oh gone crooked. <laughs> Look, there's your dead body. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the idea is that. He actually just said that, basically. <laughs> the idea is that her body has been reincarnated, or her soul has been reincarnated, but it, it's sort of asleep. So, but there is still the idea that he's murdering or, or taking away the modern girl to replace her with the old. Right. Exactly. Soul. So yeah, there's a little bit of yeah room there for 
speculation. And he still clearly has the strength you know, to be able to lift her up and tear her. Those eyes, so expressive. You've got a sense of love for her lost mate there, but also a sense of wonder. At... Beautiful woman, flat as a board, but beautiful woman. <laughs> the, uh, the 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 the. Thought there, so I'm going to destroy this. You're going to take his place, but for a few moments, there's a little bit of terror in that. Yeah, but I love her. You know, like I said, the the expression, the the um sense of awe and wonder, but also you see that set growing sense of love again. So mummies make good kindling, I guess. Well, they would, Pretty and they'd smell good, <laughs> and they'd smell good too because they'd have a lot of like cinnamon in and. All kinds of nice. Well, the resins things. that they use too um, are the main ingredients in incense. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Literally the same incense that the Catholic Church still uses in in ceremonies. I do love the uh, the incense at morning mass on Sundays. Oh yeah. Such a nice way of drawing in all of the physical senses into worship as well, not just sitting there and thinking That's about exactly it. That's exactly how I feel about her top. <laughs> I do love it. <laughs> drawing in all the senses. I keep, keep, keep trying to, to steer the conversation back to something <laughs> about the movie, but Al and Troy are like, nope, we're going to ogle. Well, well you know, I'm focused on the movie. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, Professor, I, I was an altar boy for six years. You don't want to be on the receiving end of that incense, though. <laughs> when you're... What do you mean? Oh, like, oh yeah, oh, that stuff right, can yeah. sizzle and pop. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. It smells nice, though. Yeah, from the sensor. <laughs> Just the smoke from the I sensor. Re <laughs> I remember during... I, I don't know if it was an Easter, Matt. I don't know if it was... I think, I think it must have been Easter or Good Friday or something. But we were... They, they were doing the incense and they put it right down next to me and it just it, it literally like I'm going to go to him and, just, <laughs> and I was just getting hit with smoke yeah, it might have been an Easter vigil I know that's when they usually bring it out the uh, yeah, yeah I think it was I think it yeah. was because at Christmas time they have the crash up where I used to sit and I was sitting up front that is a nasty knife yeah mm, yeah I, just, <laughs> I don't want to get stabbed with that. That's... And this is the, the terror where he says you'll take her place, but for a moment, this is the death and rebirth you must undergo. How interesting uh, conflict with the slave there. I love his ring. That scarab. I don't, do we ever get a really good close-up look of it in the movie? Uh, not so much in the movie, but there are um, photographs and promotional pics of it. Like there's this one of him with his arms crossed, and you get a good mm -hmm. good view of it. <laughs> okay. Okay, Burke says, oh, stop being dramatic, lady. He's just going to stamp your hand for re-entry. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> I know his horrible plan is going to kill her and make her a living mummy like himself. Yep. We, we, we better go to the rescue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Well placed dialogue. Osiris will release thy soul. And again, the God who comes back from the underworld, Osiris, so. Mm -hmm. 
and that's the scene of her on the altar there, yeah. which is in a, a lot of the promotional art too. The the it's in the movie poster. I even put it in the thumbnail because mm -hmm. that's so menacing him over her like that. And that's the pathos of the mummy in this movie. He thinks in his mind that he's doing something good for her. He's bringing back his lost love, but he's truly killing this woman so his lost love can come back. He doesn't quite get that. Not that he would care if he did anyway. He's, he's stuck on getting his lost love. But I did like, you know, we were drawing a lot of comparisons because you can't help to, but the 99 movie. But there's a video game came out for the PS2 for the 99 film in which you could either play from the, the hero, the Brendan Fraser character perspective, or you could play from Emotep's perspective. Oh. And you drew a lot on this original movie, which is you trying to bring back your love and trying to, you know, uh, go through and stuff. It was actually a really cool concept. That's pretty terrific, too. Or, you know, terrific isn't terrifying when the blade does actually touch her flesh, but just doesn't quite pierce it. Well, I guess they they guess they do interrupt him, right? That's okay. <laughs> That's a good shot of the ring, man. Oh yeah, okay. What color is it in color? Uh, I don't know. It's usually I black. I guess is it? it's probably aquamarine. Oh, because okay. usually that's the the color of of gem they used. Uh, and most oh, of the okay. uh, recreations they use like a an onyx. Yeah. To Isis to the rescue. It's a superhero movie after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's That's not pretty. That oh, transition. Go ahead, Agent. I was, I was going to say he's not coming back from that, I think. No, no, no. no. <laughs> and that's, that's interesting because whereas in all the other monster movies they had to find a way even after you thought the the creature was dead they they find a way to bring him back in in the next movie oh yeah in this one they just go well you know it doesn't have to be the same mummy exactly you know? exactly yeah, the concept of the mummy is more interesting and that's what i was saying too about how the the sequels are more of the the visceral monster coming back you know in the end um whereas this movie was more of that uh mystical kind of story love story but they, they, I, I, uh, why did they end it so abruptly? It deserved more of a denouement. Yeah. Even just a few moments more. It's ended so abruptly. Do you know anything about that, Al? Uh, no, but I do like they they do the same thing that they did in uh, Frankenstein. A good cast is worth repeating. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because they do it at the beginning and the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of the Universal... Uh, pictures like they the initial one. I mean, you look at the Wolfman, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Well, the Creature from Black Lagoon, they knew they were making another one, but like the Wolfman ends, and they they have to figure out a way to make him come back because it was a hit. Yeah, but even in that one scene right there, you know, you had him saying her love, your love for her might bridge the, her love for you might bridge the centuries. And you just have her open her eyes, and it's just so quick. Like the pacing just suddenly speeds up so much, and it's not a proper denouement. It is. I think what's really what what's what's really crummy about exactly that is the fact that they did spend so much time, you know, building these characters and developing these characters and their motivations. And you know, we even talked earlier on about the pacing and and how it doesn't have to be, you know the the quick quick modern way of doing it but then the end is just boop boop we're done yeah, yeah. Well, like i said you know if if you do this movie today it would have um an ep like an epilogue where her and um the guy are go off and then she sees something or grabs something and she starts <laughs> to have that memory of the past and mm -hmm. or she or she like or the guy's taking a shower, and then you see her hand holding that that weird dagger thing. Or they would they would do something to go <gasps> for the audience. Well, and which is exactly what they did do it. with with the the Brandon Fraser mummy, right? Because yeah. they had the second movie, and she is 
they're they're developing that whole thing of her getting some of her memories back of her past life and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. you know but uh i mean yeah i i love to speculate what would we do if we uh if we could you know be put in charge of it and 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 show them how it's done you know mm-hmm well, how about this? Um, she 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 looks in the mirror and Hotep's right behind her. And then she wakes up. Oh, it was a nightmare. She turns in her bed and Hotep's next to her. And then she wakes, wakes up again. again. <laughs> <laughs> dream within a dream within a dream, right? Oh no, <laughs> Cisco neighbor hated those. He they hated those uh those dream jump those dream hmm. those dream scare sequences. Yeah, I blame I blame Dallas. Remember they had the whole. Patrick Duffy in the shower, like wipe out an entire season of the show. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Back then, when no one else had done it before, it was brilliant. But that now, since then, it's been so overused. You know, <laughs> I, I still, th- I still think the most brilliant ending, and it, it's kind of in the same vein, was New Heart. Yep. Oh yep, yeah. Yep. <laughs> brilliant. Wipe out the entire series. It was yeah. all all a dream of the guy from the Bob Newhart show. And while acknowledging his previous series. I yeah. love that. Yeah. You should wear more sweaters. And then of course bring back uh uh oh, I can't remember her name now. His wife, yeah. Boy playing yeah. his wife, yeah, but uh bring her bring her back. It was just, oh god, that was glorious. That's a, that was a great way to end, end the series i i mean that's a funny little joke but my favorite tv series suzanne ending, Flechette. thank you Flechette, yeah suzanne Flechette. yeah thank you Flechette. favorite tv series ending is everyone loves raymond because it didn't didn't have to go end the story it didn't i hate it i hated the mary tyler moore our friends or whatever they have to like send everybody off and end this chapter of the tale i liked it with everyone loves raymond you end with the whole family around the kitchen table continuing to do what you love them doing. And that just gives you a mm-hmm. fond send off memory of them, you know? Well, you know, big, big bang ended kind of that way. They were all sitting in there eating Chinese food. I'm talking and- about good shows though. <laughs> <laughs> to bring up another example, elementary, the newer Sherlock Holmes show. It didn't, it's final episode. You could just see the show continuing on from there if you wanted to, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, I'm glad cheer- it doesn't. Cheer- <laughs> cheers. Cheers kind of ended that way too, where you just, it was, you knew it was just going to open the next day and everybody's going to show up at the bar. Well, not everybody. <laughs> and then there's Blake Seven where everyone dies at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Spoilers! Spoilers. <laughs> for, for a 30-year-old series. <laughs> oh, I remember Al's uh, reaction when I think someone was talking about the fifth Rambo film and he screamed, Spoilers! Like he was... <laughs> <laughs> uh... So what's in that movie next? What's the next one? Next up is Dracula. Yeah, I'm gonna be on vacation. What about a week after that? What, 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 what's the slate? What's the slate of all? We got Dracula, uh, Son of Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. Because oh, for crying out loud, just go to the Professor Geek Facebook group where I have the list. Let me I double have list. Mr. Geek here. <laughs> I just <laughs> dropped the link. You can just click on it. I know. I, <laughs> let me double check that though, because I think I've got that right. But it does see because yeah, we're. I mean, we're, October's here in a, in a day or two. So let me just double check that and see if I've got that right. Um, what if I still have Son of Frankenstein on the DVR? They they I, I recorded a bunch of those uh, one year. They had the. Um, the uh the the Frankenstein month on TCM, so they were doing all the Frankenstein, and the first yeah. half. Uh-huh. No, sorry, go Frankenstein ahead, yeah. all the time. I was gonna say the first half was the Universal Frankenstein's, and then the second half was the Hammer Frankenstein movies. That's what mm-hmm. they did TCM. So yeah, uh, next week is Dracula, then the Son of Frankenstein on the thirteenth, Wolfman on the twentieth, and then um, the twenty seventh is our last Tuesday night classics before Halloween. And we'll either watch Halloween Tree, the animated film, on that day, or we might finish up the book study that day and watch Halloween Tree on the Thursday. Uh, we'll, we'll see how we divvy up the Halloween Tree for that. But, uh, but yeah, so the, the last three classic Universal Monster movies here. And we're bringing in Son of Frankenstein again because we've already watched Frankenstein and Bride introduce Bela Lugosi as Igor for everyone. So Cool. And of course, cool. Ha- Halloween night, young Frankenstein. <laughs> That's another one. That's yeah, over on Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. Frankenstein. Have any of you seen uh, Abbott and Costello meet the mummy? 
Yes. That's a classic. Are you watching that one now? Are you watching Brick Evan and so I'm the watching Beats. Star. I'm watching Beats Frankenstein. Frankenstein, the yeah, one, yeah. Yeah, the one with um on Cheney Jr., Bella Lugosi, and Glenn Strange as the monster, and a special cameo at the end. Mm -hmm. That's a great name for a horror movie actor, Glenn Strange. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's serendipitous. I, I love the behind the scenes image on the lot of Glenn Strange in his Frankenstein makeup. And Blythe Danner was in another movie. She's playing a mermaid, and he's carrying yeah. her as a mermaid. So you got this cool mashup behind the scenes photo. Yeah, he was a he was a he was a pretty nice guy by all accounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. So, uh, so yeah, we might as well go ahead and um, give the, the calendar here for what's coming up. This is uh, Tuesday. Tomorrow night is Wednesday, and you have your choice of Green Lion Girl, who's with us here. Her um, until dawn re uh, play through that she's continuing well, to actually do. Do, what time does daniel heron uh soundtracks with birdman start we're doing, the eight, we're doing it at 8 30 8 30 okay. yeah so he actually starts i think a little bit earlier okay you know? and then you know, so you could like you know catch the beginning of his show and if you want to then jump over to uh green lion girls uh playthrough of until dawn which yeah and that, that's good yeah, so uh, i catch the end of that after my D, &D game and you, you could always, uh, you know, uh, I guess you can't have them both running at the same time, can you? I don't oh, yeah. Well, you can. It's okay. just it might know, get it's a challenge to, to, okay. to, to, to attend to both of them, but you certainly could. But we're um, doing uh, we're doing Superman the movie. We're going to be discussing the John Williams score while watching it. And uh, okay. I figure we should do the theatrical cut since Professor Geek did the special edition. So I figure we'll do the theatrical right. version. And, let and me, by uh, all means, and everyone add, should... Before, let me go ahead and just put in there before then, since you're doing the Superman, you need to watch Sound Engraver's video that yeah. she dropped yeah. yesterday. Well, I just dropped her her, her channel because I was about to say exactly that. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's an amazing... It's like 45 minutes long. It's an amazing analysis of John Williams' Superman theme. And it it's so cool because it draws out all the things we've been saying about Superman as a hero from a story perspective, from a, a storytelling perspective, and all of that. But she pulls out how the music also brings all that out and, and what's you know good in that. So really cool. Definitely check that out. Mm -hmm. but yeah, thanks for dropping that link, Troy. Um, and she's doing you know what I will. Uh, I, I I'll grab that last video and I'll drop her the link for that particular video for her. And she has a He-Man one coming up as well, right? I'm That's looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Did I drop into the Professor Greek group the uh the uh, video about uh where it took the 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 soundtrack and 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 audio and whatnot from the He-Man cartoon and dubbed it over the the movie. Yeah, the live action. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, so yeah, once so, yeah, I just choice. dropped that video there. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, definitely check that out and give it a like and a thumbs up. Very cool. And if you haven't subscribed to Sound of Graver, also trying to get her to a thousand cool. for uh. For the monetization threshold hmm. but uh yeah your choice tomorrow for uh for uh soundtracks of birdman or does green lion girl does your your uh gamer stream have a does your gamer show on wednesdays have a name or are you just calling it until dawn um, hmm. but people seem to like that you know being able to play along and choose to make the choices with you and everything so and also green lion girl what time does your does your show start um AJ Boomer, you said that uh, Soundtracks with Birdman starts at 8.30 Eastern? Yeah, yeah, we're going to be doing it at 8.30 Eastern. And like I said, I don't know yet if it's a weekly thing yet or not, or if we're, we're just playing it by ear for now. But uh, mm -hmm. gotcha. yeah, because I know I can't do anything next week because I'm going to be on uh, vacation. But uh, yeah. Go, go. Vacation? Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> Day trips because of COVID. But, uh, you oh, know, yeah. um, I'm just trying to relax a little bit, I think. Good, yeah. good. Any, I mean, any certain. I'll let you know. There's a, there's a, there's a big cat habitat. I've been meaning to see, so I might go check that okay. out. So you're, you're in, um, you're Florida. in Florida, right? It's Florida, yes. Florida. He's Florida man. <laughs> yes, I'm Florida man. <laughs> yeah, and, I have uh, uh, I have family down there, and I have a, I have a nephew, a nephew, a cousin that kind of does that, goes around and visits and takes pictures and stuff. Cool. 
So on Thursday, that's a, the finishing up of Dune, the book study. We're going to wrap that up and uh, a lot of fun. We'll wrap all that up and then we'll also lay out the slate uh, divisions and everything for the Halloween tree to, to get us in the Halloween spirit, which will be a lot of fun. Cool. And a pre-show for that too. Uh, I'll figure out what I'm doing at some point between now and then, <laughs> but uh, that's there. Then Friday, of course, is what's going on on Friday Night Frights? Uh, Al, what's he doing? Friday the Night Frights, we are doing the Hammer version of The Mummy starring uh, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, and yes, yes. which takes a, a little bit more from the Cheney Mummy mm -hmm. uh, uh, story storyline, but it definitely has mm -hmm. has a lot of elements of this one as well. Mm -hmm. And I might uh, I might do my Night of the Old Republic playthrough Friday night too. I don't know exactly. Um, I might just do it. After, I might have to do it Sunday. I don't. It depends on my schedule, but. That's uh that's coming up at some point this weekend, but uh, then Saturday, of course, uh, I think Wolf Ten Media is still doing his we watch thing on Saturday and Saturday night on uh whose channel's got that Saturday night? That's me. I that's got Troy? in the mouth of madness. Um, uh, again the, the 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 third and final uh entry in the John Carpenter Apocalypse trilogy. Um, nice. with Sam Neill. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let me drop uh, Wolf Squadron also mm -hmm. in case he is doing something. I don't know, but by all means, just go and subscribe and hit the notification bell, and you'll know when his Weeb Watches come up. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Sunday, of course, the uh, the, the, the dual uh, or the, the couple options there for you, uh, Mr. Matchstick, his Weeb Watch. I think it starts a little earlier. Well, and no, then, we actually uh, have it so that uh, Study Hall starts first at okay. – uh, Eight o'clock Eastern gotcha. time. No, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Eight o'clock Central time. So, no, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> nine o'clock. Yeah, yeah, nine o'clock. Here, boomer. Uh, what? <laughs> it's eight o'clock Central, nine o'clock Eastern. Nine o'clock Eastern. Yeah. Yes. And then we finish up uh, promptly in time for you to switch over to Mr. Matchsticks Weeb Watch at uh, ten o'clock. Central eleven o'clock Eastern. Gotcha. And let me drop his link. There we go. Any teases for topics from study hall this week? Oh, uh, Leia plus. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm speaking out loud. That's oh, a topic for study yeah. hall. Oh, you were talking to me. Um, we are going to be doing. Um, we are going to be doing a well, Disney layoffs. That was one that came up today. Uh, What'd you say? Yeah, the, the Disney layoffs. Disney layoffs. Um, gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, Rumors of, uh, or not rumors, I think it's a done deal. Uh, sequel to The Lion King. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's totally what we need. Rumors of Brie Larson, Captain Marvel to appear in a rumored Disney Plus series featuring Nick Fury. Oh, oh. yay. All the good news, right? Hmm. Bill and Ted 4 not happening, says oh, the man. writer Ed Solomon. I it should <laughs> well, right. The story's done. What else is there? Unless they, <laughs> unless they fix the crap story that they did in the last one. Well, they just pretended that the end of uh, Bogus Journey didn't happen, so they could just pretend that Face the what, Music what, didn't happen too. I, I didn't. Right. I didn't really talk too much about uh, Bill and Ted Three. I might do it a little bit more on Sunday, but uh, I looked at that again in terms of my whole take on time travel stories and i'm like they broke the cardinal rule they had established how time travel works and in and it wasn't consistent with their first two movies mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah so um, mr master yeah. putting in there the first four episodes of ghost stories dub is uh is the we watch so and, and of course it's, you can also talk about it's about to, uh of course it's about to be october and we all know what's coming this month. Mandalorian. Yay. Oh, is it dropping this this month? Yeah, it starts at yeah, it starts this month. More Ahsoka. Oh boy. Also rumored that uh, Captain Marvel will be guest starring on the Nick Fury series for Disney Plus. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I I I, I, I yeah. I Everybody's that. asked for that, so of course. Yeah. He's no, got that. Fever, what they're going to try and do there is they're going to try and attach her to as many other characters that people actually like as they possibly can 
because they've thrown all their eggs in that basket and don't know how to get out of it. So, yeah, well, unfortunately, what I I, I don't really see the the Marvel universe continue. I think people are no. starting to it needs to stop. First, <laughs> they lost all the momentum. Even if the movies were doing well, there's been such a long stretch. Mm-hmm. I, I called it. I, I called it in my in my reviews and talks about Endgame. I said that has killed the MCU, and I said everybody's going to say you're so stupid. It's still so amazing, and all these movies play. I said no, it's killed it. Now you might have some momentum still going, where a couple movies still get some pretty good success because they want to find out about that character or whatever. But you will be able to look back in hindsight and see the drop off, and you'll be able to see that's the moment. Endgame was the end, and and, and that's happening. It's happening. So. And one more time, I'm dropping the link for Netter's uh, recent video. Please go, go give it a like. Maybe drop a comment, encourage her a little bit, because you know, I know how tough it is when you're you're a first yes. timer and you get your first video out there. Yeah, I liked it. I watched it earlier. It was actually it was actually useful. It was a useful tip. I didn't think yeah. to do it, actually. Yeah, definitely. She's on a she's on a board uh, on Facebook that's uh, like the clutter bugs and how to you know help help people get organized and you know sometimes it's just Man, her whole her whole shtick was you know there's a lot of things that seem pretty obvious but to some people they've never thought of it before no, here's, I, here's yeah. one for here's one for Nanette to kind of think about how does a person with very little space deal with the fact they have a lot of books and want to keep them <laughs> yeah. okay i'll mention that to her and and, and ask the her answer her is like be more judicious I was but very see, there's, there's a reason that I don't do a channel like that because whenever I've been confronted with getting rid of clutter, I always say, you know, one match takes care of all of it. Yeah. Yep, there you go. Yeah, that's not the solution most people want, though. No. <laughs> yeah, I've I um, realized that. So that is Sunday. Monday, again, since Sound Engraver is still away on her uh, her trip. There's no Monday Night Muse stream this Monday, but like I said, she will. She has timed the uh, He-Man theme analysis, which is going to be really cool to yeah. drop on Monday. So definitely keep your tape tabs on our channel for that. And I'll drop her link again in case there's anybody that's here that isn't already subscribed to her. You should yes. go and subscribe. Yes. But, um, Professor, am I still going to be doing that night? The yep. Dune yep. Since we don't have a, a live stream that night, uh, that's when Troy is doing. Troy is hosting the Dune, uh, Dave Lynch Dune rewatch. So uh, because Troy's just, uh, you know, so much about that. Well, they finished it. And uh, you want to go ahead and say anything about the, the Dave Lynch movie or what version people should get or whatever? Or uh, yeah, if you have it or can find it, you should be able to find it fairly easily. I'm just going to go with the uh, the theatrical release because okay. it seems like it's the most most common one out there. There yeah. is a. Uh, special edition that came out too that tried to expand it a little bit with mm, varying they success in, they put in cut scenes and you could tell it i, I remember uh, yeah. some of them weren't finished because the front end didn't have blue eyes in a lot of them <laughs> <laughs> yep yep i noticed that too so so yeah we're we're going to be looking at the the theatrical release i think that's the the best way to go going into it understanding very well that it is a very truncated um telling of of the story uh not the uh the story that lynch wanted to tell sure but we'll yeah. talk about the the hows and the why what the version I have is two hours and sixteen and change. That so. sounds about right. It was a longer film. Yeah, yeah, and it but, still was not as long as it needed to be, mm -hmm. in my opinion. In many but people's still, opinion, but still great sandworms. Oh yeah, yeah. Shyamu there's a lot of good. Awesome. There's a lot of good there. There's a lot, a lot of good stuff in it. Still, uh, a lot of the design was good. Just some of the story elements kind of went astray. <laughs> yeah. Well, th there's definitely a, a David Lynch esque, uh, you know, uh, bit there that that you kind of have to, you know, if if you like David Lynch, you like it. If you don't, you don't. I mean, anyway, yeah. Well, I, so we'll look at that then I, next Monday. I and then, I, I um, like it. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 
I said I, I could continue, but I didn't know if I'd be chastised chastised if I did. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, you know, let's not spend all the night talking about the Dune, but do you have something to say about it before you move on? Or? I was just going to say I liked it because I saw I saw it before I read the book. Okay. That's all I was going to um, say. Makes sense, yeah. And uh, that is uh, Monday night. Now, the I, I, I think the plan is for the um, – Second Cup Cafes is Tuesdays. It's live. Thursdays is pre-recorded. If that sticks, we'll see. But uh, so Thursday yeah. should be a pre-recorded. But Tuesday should be coming back live that morning. But um, that's on Fan Man's channel. And then Tuesday night, of course, we're back here for Dracula, Bela Lugosi classic, Universal wow. Dracula. And again, I'm going to plug the the professors group, which just keeps growing. I kind of love it. It's good, um, yeah. But that's where I keep uh, posting. You know, all the links are there. All the schedules are there. Um, and the conversations from here continue. So definitely a, the, the place to be in between streams. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I have scheduled is Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in a week and a half. Yep. Mm -hmm. Those guys were comic geniuses. Oh, yeah. 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 And it was really cool seeing the comedy with the, the monsters and everything and the original actors and stuff for the most part. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He had Bill Lugosi back as Dracula, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Lon Chaney back as Wolfman. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, that's the whole um, the whole slate for the week anyway. And like uh, Troy did drop the Facebook group, you're welcome to go to the Facebook group, keep the conversation going all week long, and uh, always be updated there by the, uh, the schedules and everything. So great community. Great, a lot, of, a lot of good content from people who are starting up their own channels and doing things within the community. So really good. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Trooper FN. Says, yep, I like the stream. Thank you, sir. Thanks, RK Burns, and everybody who showed up tonight. That was a lot of fun. And uh, anything else from the movie for you guys before we sign off? Oh, All right. <laughs> good, good stuff. So, uh, so yeah, Uh Come back, come back tomorrow for all the other good content. Until then, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the stories you love. <laughs>